Okay, so hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, to everyone coming for our three hour deep dive session here about um, observability in the area of Java and, um, and Kubernetes. So yeah, we're gonna spend the next three hours together, hopefully. Um, this is the first time we're going to do the talk in this kind of length. We have given this talk before, but um, this, th this format is something we haven't done, um, so we don't exactly know how we're gonna do things time-wise. We certainly plan to do a break um, for about 15 minutes or so, um, but at the moment we cannot exactly say when this is going to be, so we try to put it somewhere in the middle, of course, but it's going to depend on how things go. So before we're going to go into the, um, into the details, uh, we're just going to do a quick introduction. So Tiffany, may, may you so, want to Hi, I'm Tiffany Jernigan. <laughs> I'm short. I'm 156 centimeters, so I have to sit on, stand on this thing <laughs> so that the camera can see me. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, so <coughs> I am a developer advocate at VMware. Uh, focused on Tanzu and open source things with Kubernetes and a bit of Spring. Um, if you're trying to learn more stuff about Kubernetes or Spring, there's a bunch of free like training courses that we have on uh, Cube Academy and Spring Academy. And if you use Twitter slash X still, um, that's my thing up there. And I'm going to get down now. <laughs> OK. Um, my name is Matthias. <laughs> And I'm 1 meters 83, and that's the first time I'm saying this ever in a presentation. So but I, but I'm going to use that podium as well. So it might look a little bit odd now, but anyway, it, I hope we're going uh, to be friends still. Yeah, uh, I work for a company called uh, Novatec in, um, in southern Germany. We operate um, mostly in the area of Germany and, and, and countries around. Um, in that, I mostly try to help our clients uh, on their way uh, in their cloud native journey either on enabling them education, POC, hands-on stuff, or like long-term support. Um, <coughs> which I just wanna had added this slide recently because we're now also proud trainings partners in the Linux Foundation, so we teach for the CKAD classes. So if you wanna get certified or you need training for your companies, feel free to see me. And I'm also teaching outside of my regular job. So I'm lecturer at two universities in the area of Stuttgart for the area of distributed systems and, and modern software architecture. And yeah, a lot of these things is where I try to combine, well, traditional lecture material with um, modern technologies from like the CNCF space and most of our um, like uh, sample applications or Im implementations are done in the, in the JVM background. So this is also some, had certainly some influence on this talk. All right. Um, if you want this slide deck, this is basically the, the link to it. I don't think we have uploaded the latest version to it yet, so we're gonna do this after the talk, um, but I'm gonna show this thing in the end, so you can then decide if you really liked it and you wanna download it. Um, yeah, so in general, what is this going to be about? Um, observability is a broad topic, and, and so is probably Java and Kubernetes as well. So we call this like a hitchhiker's guide. Technically, more like what we want to do is um, explore various toolings, various kind of approaches to monitor applications and mostly Java applications running within Kubernetes. Um, so it's not going to be like a deep dive on one particular kind of tool. It's more like an, an, an overview of the various things that are around. Of course, we can't cover all of them, but we kind of categorize in, into certain groups. And um, yeah, definitely try to, to demo some things, basically how you would install and configure it and what kind of metrics you get out of that and um, basically help you, hopefully, in your considerations what you want to apply or not apply for, for, for given scenarios. So this is kind of the agenda. Um, so basically, Tiffany is going to start give a general overview or introduction about yeah, why monitoring Kubernetes, what makes it so difficult, and so on. Um, then I'm going to walk you through a couple of tools based on the Kubernetes API. Um, after that, we're going to talk a bit about Prometheus and Grafana. And uh, after that, going into like monitoring on a network level with, with the help of service meshes. And as a final part, um, going on an application level 
and, and, and we use basically the, uh, some, like the implementation with open telemetry. So also from that flow, it basically starts on a very high entry level and is getting more into the details um, of, of, of monitoring metrics and also as also configuration. So as I said, time-wise, we don't know exactly how long that goes, so uh, probably like maybe 30 to 45 minutes for, for each point. We're probably going to do the, the break between Prometheus, uh, Grafana, and then and, and, and service meshes. Uh, but as I said, this, this totally depends on how the demos go, and, and we feel like, okay, we probably should do a break now. Maybe also do 10 minutes twice. We'll, we'll have to see. All right, so that's that. Um, and now I, I'll step down again <laughs> and uh, hand over to Tiffany for the intro. Yeah, I've never had to do this before. It makes me feel so tall. So, yeah. Uh, so why observability? Why do we actually care about this stuff? And why did you all come join here? So basically, it, who here has uh, dealt with Kubernetes so far? OK, like maybe 2 thirds of the room either raised your hand or just decided you didn't want to. That's fine, too. Um, but if you have, you probably know that it can be pretty complex. Um, you have a bunch of different API objects. You have a bunch of things running. And trying to figure out what all is happening with all of that by manually just looking into things can be pretty chaotic. So basically, there's just so much that you need to understand. So we're hoping to be able to show you instead of just being like, hey, this is what I have. I'm so confused. I can't tell what all is happening besides maybe like doing a describe, et cetera, on things, to have tools that we can use to be able to actually see what is happening, both like what with specific things in the cluster and things with how they're interacting with each other. So to try to like level set for folks that may not know as much about Kubernetes or may not have dealt with it before, I'm just going to do a little uh, overview of a few things. So there's uh, two separate sections that you can see here. So we have the application level or workloads, and then we also have the infrastructure where we have our nodes. So basically, just as a very high level, um, Kubernetes, basically, you have a the concept of a cluster, which has a bunch of different nodes in there, and those nodes can run a bunch of different types of workloads. It's not specific to any language. I mean, we're here to mostly talk about Java, but you can also do things in Go and other languages, whatever you specifically want for running on a container for having your application. So to look specifically at the infrastructure, um, we have two main parts. There is the control plane. And this basically has the API server, which we'll take a look at a little bit later. And it has control over the cluster. And then the other side is the worker nodes. And usually for wanting high availability, you want to have multiple nodes. That way, if you, have, if you just have one and it goes down, well, no one can use your applications. And then you might not be able to make money, et cetera. Um, so you can basically scale those up and down as needed. You'd be like, hey, I only need two now. Maybe I want five later. And that is totally fine. And then if we take a look at the applications and the workloads, we, as I kind of mentioned a little bit, uh, we can have uh, different languages. You can have different things running on them. And based on that, you might have different ways of specifically monitoring. Maybe there's something specific for Spring or whatever that you can use for learning more about your application if you are using that framework. And basically, we want to know like, what all is happening with our applications. Is everything working as expected or not? Basically, is everything fine there? And so like, there's a question of like, why is observability so challenging? So if you take a look at Kubernetes, we have some of the uh, API objects here that you may be <coughs> familiar with. So maybe things like pods, which is where you're running your containers. There's replica sets. There's ingress, services, deployments, and a bunch of other things. Basically, in your cluster, you have a bunch of components. And then potentially, you have a bunch. It's like maybe polyglot. You have a bunch of different languages for your applications. So basically, with all of this stuff, you need to understand like about the API objects. Maybe you need to understand something specific for uh, learning for observability for your framework or language. Basically, there's just so much that is there. So that can just make it really hard to, for one person, for instance, to be able to figure out. And so one thing to highlight is the API server. So this is just like a single component. It's running once on the cluster in your control plane. And it's basically how users interact with, the, with Kubernetes. So you can specifically just do things like if you're using the CLI for kubectl, or however you might pronounce it, of looking and seeing what pods are running, for instance. And 
we'll be able to see a bit later of how important this comes in for observability. So just to kind of give a little bit of a summary for everything, we have all of these different API objects and more. Um, you have your infrastructure, you have your worker nodes, you have a, potentially a bunch of different languages that you're, or frameworks that you're using for running your applications. And we care about like all these different things here and how to observe that. And as well as like how these different components may interact with each other. We don't just care about what is the individual state of like that user or the cart. We want to know how they're interacting with each other. And that's very common in if you're using microservices, basically that you have different pieces for your whole entire application. Maybe you have your front end and your back end and are these communicating? Are there is it just 100% errors for what's happening between the two of them? Is it is there things like high latency or is there stuff like it's a connection oversaturated? Like there's just so many different things that you need to look into. There's things that are like app specific metrics, there's infrastructure specific metrics. And basically in short, because of all of that, uh, it can be pretty complicated sometimes for observability for Kubernetes. So if we want to observe applications in Kubernetes, we kind of need to understand a little bit of how they're handled. So like we know now kind of like what we care about and what we need or want to observe. So the next question basically is, well, how do we get this kind of information? So with various like aspects of such a type of environment, um, we also have integration points for monitoring agents. So like, for instance, we could have something that we care about maybe for our application there. And for that application, the application runs specifically in a container, and that's another level there. We have another wrapper on that, which is a pod. And then outside of that, there is a node that you will be running your pod on. So this cute little mustached guy here um, basically wants to be able to, you want to be able to observe at each of these different levels that we have here, and that can make it a little complicated. So just trying to look through at each one of these things, looking at the API server and looking at each of these different components. And so we could, for instance, place an agent there over at the API server for, to get collect metrics and put that in some sort of dashboard. We could also look at the level of the nodes as well. We can look at our app. We can also have the ability to have um, like a proxy running in some sort of sidecar with our application too that's running in the same pod, which we'll look into when we hit service mesh a bit later. So basically, these are all various points that you can look at for observability, for getting different types of metrics. And not only are you basically like seeing different types of metrics for it. There's also a difference in like price. Maybe there's different like overhead. There's different configuration costs. Maybe you'll have to potentially restart or rebuild your components. Like certain levels might be more complicated or easier than others, especially like for instance, if you hit app level, then again, it kind of matters what language or what frameworks are you using for that. Basically in the end, it ends up being a trade-off of what you actually need. You may not need to have it for every single possible thing. So let's go a little bit into tools. Um, if you haven't seen it before, uh, this is a picture of the CNCF uh, landscape. Um, there's a bunch of stuff here, uh, all open source things, pretty much um, for things related to Kubernetes. So basically, if you know everything on here, um, please teach me your ways. I don't know how you would. <laughs> Uh, but if we look in this little section here, this is specifically for things with observability. If we dive into that a little bit more, we have things such as uh, monitoring, logging, tracing, and there's a couple other things there. And you can kind of see in some of them that's like incubating or sandboxed or whatever with that. But our goal a little bit later will be to pick some of these things here to, like that we have some sort of experience with and show how to use those to get observability into your Kubernetes cluster. Okay, <clears throat> so I'll climb the box again. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to um, add a few things to that. I mean, it's, uh, we have three hours and that's quite long, but it's probably not gonna be long enough to, to cover each and everything in here. 
Um, also, um, one of the things we certainly want to do, we want to focus only on open source technologies and try to stay away from any kind of, let's say, vendor pitches or something like that. Especially, I mean, if you think about that diagram from before, there are certainly commercial tools which would probably cover all of those aspects in, in, in own uh, ways of implementation. This is not where we want to go into. We, we want to much rather say, okay, what are the open source solutions out there that we can look at and with them kind of get a feeling um, what are the technical possibilities of each of those monitoring levels? So if I use a sidecar, for example, in a service mesh, so how much will I be able to see and, and what can I not see? And how much do I have to pay and invest for that? Um, and not, I'm not talking about money things here. It's more like how, the, how much overhead does it take? What, when, what, how much does it affect the running application and so on? Because these are all like the technical things that you need to deal with, no matter if it's an open source thing um, or, or a commercial solution, just as a little disclaimer here. All right, so then we're going to go into the first part, which is uh, basically, as we've seen here before, the, the Kubernetes API. So, well, the, the good thing with that is uh, you don't need to install anything because if you already have your cluster running, the API server will be a default part of it. And um, <coughs> to basically figure out what's going on, um, in either with your cluster or with your applications, you can use the kubectl um, command line, which is basically the standard client talking to the Kubernetes API. And with that, you can do like things like get, describe to analyze individual objects. You can query logs. Um, you can execute uh, um, into, into containers in pods. And later on, I'm going to go a bit more in this, in this debug command. So this is like your initial starting point um, on, on interacting with such a cluster. Now, there are tools um, that basically also slip into the role that kubectl does, basically connecting to the API server and querying information from them. We're going to want to show a few here. In general, you, they can be categorized in, in tools where you have, web, like, that you can access via web if you have a browser. Some of them are fat client implementations, and some of them are also based on CLI. So we're going to look a bit at these in order to see, OK, how much do they bring us? If we, if we come to a cluster and say, I have no idea what, what is going on in there, how long will it take me to figure out what is running, what is not running, and, and how deep can I see into the cluster with that? And where does it stop, and when do I need like, more advanced toolings in order to find out more? I've been talking about this um, topic for a while. And, and I think in one my, of my early presentations, I still used the tools Octant and uh, Lens uh, and WeaveWorks Scope. So what happened in the meantime, um, two of them got deprecated and, or discontinued. The other one went commercial. So this is also a very important aspect in this, in this CNCF landscape. There are many tools, and, and not, not, not all of them live very long. So um, yeah, this is also something you need to consider what, when, you, when you use something. Um, yeah, what is, what is the support with that, and to which level you're going to need, need it only for dev purposes or really in, in a production later on. So K9S is a tooling that has been there constantly. This is certainly something I, I can recommend and that we're also going to look into. Um, there are some new tools called Headlamp and Schooner that I'm also going to demo in a bit um, to show you what the, what the possibilities of that are. So we have a couple of backup slides in case the demo doesn't work. Uh, I don't want to do this now, so I want to rather switch to the, to the live mode. Okay, so let me see. Can you all see the terminal? Perfect. So the first thing we're going to look into is, uh, well, the first we're going to look into is probably the command line. So if I do a kubectl and say, for example, get pod, I get the ones in my current uh, environment. If I do like minus all namespaces, I can already see um, I have a certain limitation here with the kubectl API, which is my screen size. Especially if I query multiple objects, um, this can get difficult, and I can either make it very small so nobody can see anything, or I have to scroll a lot. Um, so, but still, I'm able to do like a kubectl, let's say, for example, describe. Um, I'm using a part now in namespace, for example, Spring Pet Clinic. And what do we have in there? This API gateway, for example. So in here, I can certainly get some information of how this is configured, 
and how the thing, uh, what, what it is using, what, what it's connecting to, and so on. I can also use the metric server and say, for example, I, uh, how are my nodes saturated or what are, some, what are my, my top pods? So these are in initial metrics I can start to play with and see, do, they, do things look halfway healthy? So with K9S, or I can switch to this other tab, um, the big advantage is also CLI based. So whenever I only have a shell or something, this will work. And this can be basically be seen as like a mini browser for your Kubernetes resources. So just a quick question, who is who's using K9S in here? Okay, so most of them are, are familiar with. So I'm gonna not spend too much time on that. Just to give you an idea of our environment. So we probably, uh, we have all of the things live, so we don't have any recordings and such. Um, so uh, as we're uh, demoing quite a, a couple of things, not everything will work fine. So we basically have um, three clusters. So we have one cluster, um, which is basically in that state where we want to be in about two hours from now. Um, this is everything is configured there with open telemetry, Istio, Prometheus and Grafana and so on. And um, so we might have to fall back to this one in case our live demo doesn't work so well. So the one we're gonna use for our purpose now is the, the DevOps cluster. So in this one, what we have is a couple of sample applications. So we have a pretty simple uh, three component to-do list application. This is like uh, something uh, we build ourselves, then we have the Spring Pet Clinic and the Open Telemetry uh, demo environment. Apart from that, we only have like an, in, an, an Nginx controller to, um, to get, uh, give us some easy URLs that we don't have to do port forward and, and, and other things. So this one we're probably gonna address and then um, have a look into it and say, okay, uh, yeah, we're gonna add the tools so you get a feeling of how complex is it to install it, um, later in the service meshes, you will see how, how you configure the, the sidecar proxies. Um, and then in open telemetry, you see how, what, like, how you add code or like add configuration to, to the applications and um, get the metrics out of that. So yeah, for those ones that didn't raise their hand yet, um, basically in here you can query all the components that you normally can query from command line as well. So you can see if the nodes, for example, here, you got CPU, memory uh, information. So on a high level basis, this will show you what is going right or wrong. So we have all the pods running healthy here. We see this one has crashed 280 times, almost. It will be there soon. Um, so we, we can all get an information, okay, something might not be okay on this one. Um, also, we see, like, we see the things that we don't see. We, we, we know how many things are running in a certain namespace, but we don't see who is basically connecting to whom? And um, are, are all the applications actually as fine as they should be? We can, of course, go in there and say, um, yeah, I want to look, I want to look at the logs and um, I want to start from the beginning. So um, this, these are our metrics we certainly gonna, we, we, we can see. We also can use the, the describe command and get the, the, the more beautiful formatted output here. Um, <clears throat> to, to work with these objects. Okay, so let's say this could potentially be used for a high-level diagnosis of sensing something might be right or wrong with the cluster in general or the applications on top. It is also, especially if you're new to Kubernetes, can be very helpful to kind of get a bit of an easy overview and, and aggregate things. So with that, I wanted to show two other toolings. Um, one is called... Um, headlamp and one is called schooner. So for that, I quickly have to look in our um, cheat sheet um, to apply those commands. Yeah, I, I, I apologize that I don't know all of that by heart. Um, so we're on that cluster now, so I'm just gonna... And is the font size good for everyone? Yeah, good question. Okay. Thank you. So this um, created basically a new service that we are also able to see here in K9S. Um, it's, it went into the uh, cube system. Let's see actually, one second, just to make sure we are on the right cluster. 
Uh, now it's M not. Okay. So this is yeah. <laughs> sometimes also tricky for us. So my CLI was actually pointing to a other context than than K9s, and I obviously installed it on the wrong cluster. Um, so now it's installed here, and that's what I meant. So these toolings can be pretty handy there to see. Okay, um, does it actually work? So this is the headlamp thing, which is which is running here that basically just came in. All right, so we have to create a couple of things in here. And kubectx is its own little CLI that you can use to switch between clusters or contexts. There's also a kubeNS that comes with it to easily switch between namespaces if you're doing a bunch of stuff in one namespace instead of constantly doing a dash n or dash dash namespace. All right, thanks. And finally, I'm going to create a, an, an ingress rule. So if I do a kubectl get ing minus a now, um, I see this one has just been created. So if I open it up in the browser, I get hopefully something to see. OK, not there yet. <laughs> That's a great start for the demo session. Um, give me one second. So yeah, maybe we just start debugging this now. Um, so this seems to be running absolutely well. Um. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna debug this now. So I'm just gonna change the cluster context here real quick and switch to this environment. All right, so this is basically asking for a token that I'm going to create. All right, so you will see um, this is like what most of those tools actually look like. So you get a bit of a nav better navigation and, and separation of your Kubernetes components. So you can see what, which parts belong to the workloads, um, how, many, how many pods are running, how long have they been running, you see the restarts. And given that you have, you're running things in a browser, you can of course sort them easier and so on. So I'm not going to drill through each and any of them. Um, but just like th this, what, this is what like the tools that I sh mentioned before, like Octant or Weaveworks Scope and things, they also gave you our same with, with the Lens IDE. Um, it's like a kind of an advanced kubectl um, CLI implementation where you can easily browse around and get quick overviews. Also, as this is basically being installed in the same cluster, it's easy to expose this for everyone using the cluster. Um, so it's, I would say it's, it's quite an advantage over, for example, using the, the official Kubernetes dashboard. Um, some cool things in there um, that I very actually use very often. So for example, um, I'm going to look into, let's say I'm going to filter by, by namespaces and say I want, for example, the pet clinic and I'm going to go in, in the API gateway. So I can also see the logs in here um, and can basically say from where I want to see it, do I want timestamps or not, um, and see how much I actually it, sh it should show me. But the even nicer function is actually this terminal execution. So you can basically open a terminal right here in your browser and it connects to your pod. So you can then check what is going on in your, in your environment here without actually needing a shell to connect to that. All right. Um, so this is this is this for that one. Um, I I will go back to the the slide deck in a second. I just want to make sure I'm not use, continuing on the wrong cluster. So this is the DevOx one, and and same here. I'm going to switch as well. Okay. Um, where did the slide deck go? Here. 
Okay, so we've seen that, and just for this is what basically would th things would look like in Schooner or in the others. Technically, they, they do all pretty much the same thing. So it's it's basically down to you what sh what would apply to you more, or uh, what what your users would be uh, would find the most user friendly experience. Anyway, you you see that the, the metrics are going to be the same, and the limitations are also going to be the same. So um, the next thing, or the, the final thing that I'm going to show in the uh, in the space of, of kubectl API is the, the kubectl debug command. So if I want to ask one more time, who has used the kubectl debug command? Okay, so there's fewer hands. Yeah, it's actually, it's still fairly new. So I think it was introduced in Kubernetes 123. And um, what it does, it basically, um, it allows you to put the contents of an additional container into the same namespace as your application container. And I'm, I'm not talking about the, the Kubernetes namespace here, I'm talking about the Linux namespace, like how, how containers work. So it looks a bit like a sidecar impl uh, implementation, but it is not. So basically you say, okay, um, I have my application here, this is pod name, and then I'm gonna attach a container that I built myself and, um, and basically connect it to that. That means this container does not need to be restarted, but it suddenly has now all the binaries that this debug container has. So I kind of built my own container with some special network toolings in there that I can attach then and then basically use with, um, with this environment. This is unfortunately something that the, the, those toolings don't give you yet. I hope this is still to come, but this one is like something you still need to do on a, on a command line level. So this comes particularly handy if you, for example, have a distro-less container. I mean, normally we've seen it before, like just with this API gateway from the Spring example, this one has like a bash uh, binary inside of the container. So you can execute a bash and connect to that. But if your container doesn't provide that, it's kind of hard to, to debug it. So um, I have this, this distro-less container right here. And if I say, okay, something might be wrong with this, and I'm gonna do an exec, and I'm gonna say, yeah, this distro is, and I wanna do, a shell, for example. Um, All right, so for example, basically, um, this one doesn't have any kind of uh, things in there. So I could not even, like, for example, do an ls or an env, let alone um, starting a shell. So if I use that debug command, um, and I need to look this up real quick. So I'm going to say kubectl debug, and um, I'm going to use the minus it and now I specify the image that I want to use for debugging it so this is something as I said that I built myself and I also need to specify uh, in case I have a pod with multiple containers what is the target container which namespace I would want to share so now it has to load the, the binaries of my container image, which is not actually super small, um, because I put a lot of, of, of stuff in there, and then it will attach it to um, this distro-less container. So now you can see I have a shell. I, I have root access to this container that normally don't has this binary. So and I now I can do all the things. I can do ls, I can do env, and so on, and I can start debugging. I also put things in there like nslookup or or dig or what, 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 what not to basically see if the connections to other services work in the right way in terms things go wrong. It was actually a colleague that, that brought me to this idea. Um, he said he wanted to look at like, the, the individual Java threads 
Um, and if I don't know a base container that has HTOP installed, and I said I, I don't know of a base container that has HTOP installed, but I can build a container that has HTOP installed and then connect it there. So I have HTOP now running in here, and now I can do an analysis of, okay, are, are those things behaving as they should? So I'm basically able to add things into my container, which is normally not there. I mean, this has, of course, a, a certain important side note to it. Um, this is a big security problem. I mean, normally, this should not be enabled by default so that everyone can just attach whatever container they want to a running system. Um, but if you have a certain application that shows a problem um, which is difficult to reproduce, this is certainly something uh, that, y that you can use and help in order to, to debug it on the fly um, and get some error information that you wouldn't get once, it, when it, once it's going to be restarted. Okay, um, so with that, I would probably um, leave it for this part. And, and I'll even want to thing. Um, if you're sure. trying to create, say, some sort of container image that has a bunch of different tools that you want, if you're just trying to do something simple, there's this thing called nixery.dev, where you can basically have the image as nixery.dev slash maybe htop slash jq or whatever. Basically, you just do slashes between each of the tools that you want that it may have, and it pulls down an image that has all of that in there for playing around. All right, yeah, this is something we could potentially show later on. If you want to build your own kind of debug container, um, and uh, I, I still use it, did it using a traditional Docker file because I didn't know it at the time. Yeah, so, so this is that. So to sum things up, um, on the level of um, Kubernetes API, um, we've seen a couple of, of, of tools. Uh, we've seen some things you can do. The important part here to, or to know and understand is this is certainly the least intrusive part uh, or like a, a way of monitoring or observing things of your, of your cluster. I mean, some people would argue this is not really observability, but anyway, you get an idea of what the things are that, are that are going on, and the important thing is you don't need to change anything in your cluster to enable that. Um, also, for people getting started with the technology, this can be very helpful for understanding what, how do my API objects relate, um, who is giving you what, what kind of information, and, and get a quick overview. However, there are, of course, drawbacks because it doesn't give you, as I said, all of the information. So there's just very little network information. So you can basically sometimes see what, what is going on on the wire. But what you can certainly not see is how are things being connected. I mean, who is basically which service is, cause, is calling which other services? Uh, um, is, are the, the, the traffic flows actually in a way that you, that you um, want to do it? And you totally have to depend on the quality of your logs. I mean, you get the logs, and you can aggregate those logs, of course. Um, but other than that, um, there is no other possibility to figure out what is going on with your application at that point. All right. So that was that. Can I get the, the coke real quick? <laughs> Thanks. Perfect video content. <laughs> yeah, maybe they can cut it out later. <laughs> All right. Um, so actually, this um, was not always part of this, this presentation, but it's sometimes, especially when you look at that monitoring stack, um, it's kind of hard to talk about observability in Kubernetes without mentioning Prometheus and Grafana. Especially, as you will see later on, once we look into um, Istio and if you look into OpenTelemetry, you will very often find that tools use Prometheus and Grafana as a kind of back, especially Prometheus as a time series database, as an underlying kind of infrastructure component for the observability of the, of the applications. Um, so, Hence, we're going to mention it at this point um, and show a little bit um, how it's basically being, being done and used in a, in a generic kind of way. Um, but also s later on show how it, how it is be used in, in other contexts and um, what other kind of metrics you can use and, and add there. So this is a, a high-level overview, and uh, I don't want to go into all of the details, but in, in, if, you, if you don't know it yet or haven't worked with it yet, you can imagine basically as Prometheus is the, the database that um, stores all the, the metrics in a, in, a, in a time series manner. And then you, have, uh, you can have various uh, 
like applications or libraries or components that feed into that. Um, and on the other hand, you can also have components that basically read out of that and, and render that. And, and one of those things is, is actually Grafana. Technically speaking, they would be totally independent of each other, but they, all, they very often come in a pair because um, I think Grafana initially was kind of being built um, especially for getting the metrics of Prometheus and, and showing them in, in a graphical manner. So Grafana, Grafana is heavily customizable. Uh, you can build your own fancy dashboards and align the things um, in the way that you want. And this is also what we're going to see later on. So, um, yeah, we have only one slide on that, but we did also do a bit of an, um, a demo here. So let me just switch over here. S what's that? Are you trying to break it for me? No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> so what I... Here is the, 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 the contents of the script, and here's your command line. Maybe I, I'll put it over here. Better? Yeah. OK, cool. More demo time. All right. Um, yeah, so I'm going to also, at least for this one, do a little bit of copy-pasting stuff. But so basically what I'm going to be starting with is I'm going to be using Helm uh, to install Prometheus into the cluster. Um, there's this thing called Cube Prometheus Stack, which basically has things like Prometheus installed. It also has Grafana and a bunch of different dashboards that are already pre-configured so that you can see a bunch of cool information based on that. Um, so basically, yeah, it's just going to be adding Prometheus community, stable, and then doing a update on that. And if I do typos, it's because I'm American and I have a QWERTY keyboard and this guy's German and things are a little swapped. Yeah, so be patient here with Tiffany. She has to stand on the box and has to use a different keyboard settings. So it, not, not everything is as easy. <laughs> At least I didn't try running inside of a container. Oh, yeah, sorry, I forgot to close it. Um. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. Who here has used Helm before? Probably most, yeah. What most people, yeah. Okay. All right, cool. So we have that there. And then I am going to specifically uh, install the cube Prometheus stack, and it this create namespace, obviously. It creates the namespace if it doesn't exist there already. So if we were to jump over to K9S, and I, let's see. Press zero. OK, there we go. Um, we can see that this is uh, creating here for that. And all right, so cool. That is up and running. So now we have different pieces here. So basically, there is um, a bunch of different things. So we have. Prometheus itself, um, there's CubeSate metrics, there's the operator for uh, Prometheus, there's alert manager, um, we have Grafana as well. So basically, just like all these different things come with it, you could potentially just install Prometheus by itself. If you have just Prometheus, then you can look at a bunch of different metrics there. There's a little bit, there's some graph stuff, but the ability to see into things is not nearly the same as if you have Grafana there as well. All right, so if we have that up and running, so then basically if I look at, okay, cool. So right now we have that. If we go back to over here. So right now we can, if we look here, we can see that there's a bunch of different ingresses for some things that we had already created that we're looking at. Right now we don't have anything for Prometheus. We could go do things like port forwarding, et cetera, but um, I am going to actually go and, um, create things for this. So if we go here, back to you laughing at me. No, I'm not laughing at you. It's, it's a lot of <laughs> tools, a lot of windows open. It's not, not always so easy. Um, yeah, if you aren't familiar with some of the things with uh, kubectl or kubectl or however you want to pronounce it, there's you can do a dash o JSON path, and you can get specific like parts of the JSON by doing that, which is pretty nifty. Um, so we're, and we're using nip.io to be able to go. So if we copy this here and go wherever the internet is, over here to the browser, not found. Well, there's nothing yep. on, on the, under cool. that URL. This, this is basically uh, yeah. the endpoint so of the Nginx we need to actually run it, yeah. um, ingress controller. 
So uh, we have this file here, which is cube Prometheus ingress. So basically, uh, this is actually creating the ingress for everything. So, so right now we have that link doesn't really do anything. Um, so we have things here. We have it for Grafana. We have it here for Prometheus itself. And so right now we have this ingress domain, which is the environment variable that I had gone and created. Um, if you go and use uh, this tool called env subst, basically you can just pass in the YAML file. And if you have the environment variable set, it will replace it. So then if we go do that and do a kubectl apply, And if we look at ingresses, and we could also jump over here, we can now see that we have one for Grafana and one for Prometheus there as well. So if I just go again and copy this, just so if we go back over here. OK, cool. So um, basically, this is the main point that you see when you hit Prometheus. Um, where is the plus sign? There we go. <laughs> Keyboards. Um, so basically, you can if you don't know specifically like what all you have running inside of your cluster, um, you could uh, basically click this little metrics explorer here. So you can see a bunch of different things. Um, right now, for instance, since we don't have Istio, if I were to type Istio, if I can type correctly, uh, we can see that there is nothing there. If we also did the same for Envoy, which I'm not going to hit the Y because the Y and the Z are swapped. Um, we can see there's also nothing there. If we wanted to look up something like uh, restarts, so basically we could do, for instance, uh, cube pod container status restarts total. If I hit execute here, you might still not be able to completely see what's happening here, but you can see basically it tells you um, what the containers are, endpoints, a bunch like basically a bunch of information for what is specifically failing. You can also do more specific querying here and give it things to, if you want a specific container, for instance, or a specific endpoint, or just giving some specific more information. You could also go and hit graph here, which now we can't see. There. Exactly. It's hard to really see what's going on. But um, for instance, basically, if this, because demos, but um, basically, you can kind of just see a graph of what the different things are. If we were to look over here, you can see that um, wavefront, so wavefront proxy is not uh, set up correctly right now. So as expected, it is failing. So we can see that it has restarted 283 times. Um, and then you can look down here and see for some of the other ones, like there's this one other one that had one restart. And then some of the other ones, there is no restarts, which is a good thing. Um, as time goes on, you would be able to see more. So and you can just like change how things are for that. But this only lets you see this graph for one specific thing at a time, which is helpful a bit, but not you can only see so much with that. That's basically the reason why you need something like Grafana. I mean, you, would, you probably wouldn't use this UI to really drill through your metrics and build your dashboards. This is more like for like looking into individual specific things and, and analyzing them. But you shouldn't use that for like um, like as, as your high-level dashboard because you can't summarize and, and arrange things as, as you want to do that. And then also, since I'm in Prometheus, there's also Alert Manager. So you can set up things with alerts. Um, you can see inactive, pending, what's firing, and just and then you can also go and create things. So basically, right now, for what's already here, you can scroll through. For instance, you can see Watchdog. There is some, there's a failure, and you can just kind of see more information as to what's happening, and based on that, get more information in general. And then there's things like here, where you can see that's in a pending state, so, um, and it gives you a warning, it tells you the crash reason, crash loop back off, so things that you might be able to see, for instance, if you did like a cube cuddle describe. So if I were to instead switch this to Grafana, and I never remember exactly what the password is. Okay. Oh, it's already there. All right, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> OK, so uh, depending on the setup for it, there may be different passwords, or you can set your own password, et cetera, for Grafana. Um, the default one, if you're using the uh, stack for this, is admin and prompt-operator. So if we were to click on the uh, th 
like some people call it the hamburger or whatever, but the three lines there, you can go and hit dashboards, for instance. Um, here, if we click general, so you, these things here are things that came built in, not specifically with Grafana in general, if you just installed Grafana, but like these ones are specifically ones that came with the stack that I had installed. So for instance, we could go and click on uh, this specific one, which of course has no data. I would pick one that doesn't. Um, but well, it just got installed. Yeah. So one of the reasons why we're not going to see a lot of things yet um, is probably because we, we just set it up. I mean, one thing you um, you can look for others. So I think which one did you just pick? Um, namespace pods, uh, do, resources. Like the, the one above, like yeah, just yeah. Yep. So you see, it just started a couple of minutes ago um, because we just installed it and then it started collecting data. We later on we we're gonna look at this maybe at the end again, or we can look at the at the other cluster. Um, but for the general overview of what Grafana is able to do, I think this this is this sufficient now. Yeah, so like for instance, this is for cluster resources. So you can see uh, the different, like there's different namespaces. You can see CPU usage, CPU quota, memory, memory request, just a bunch of different things in one place for different like parts of your cluster. So right now this is stuff that is like pre-built in that is being pulled from the cluster, for instance. You could also go something, do something super specific in your application and be like, I want to log this specific metric and you can get those metrics into Prometheus and then be able to look at it as well. And then later we'll be able to see things with Istio and that it will be putting stuff into Prometheus and then it, things that are being pulled from there, et cetera. So yeah. All right. Um, yeah, we are actually a little faster as we have thought. So I think it's not it's too early to basically do a break right now. So what I would probably say, um, you, you walk through the service mesh part, and maybe we do a break after that, and then do the live demo after the break, or start with the demo. Does that work for people? Yeah. yeah. OK, I mean, if somebody urgently needs a break, just like wave with us. We, we certainly we're happy to. Um, to, to um, assist. <laughs> I don't know how your thing works. There we go. That's All right. Good. Cool. Okay. So who here has heard of Service Mesh? Who here has used a Service Mesh? Okay. Fewer people. All right. Cool. So this is going to be specifically for pod-based Service Mesh. We'll get into some other things, things with nodes, etc. a bit afterward. Okay. So... Now, instead of looking at the level of uh, having some sort of agent there at the API server, um, we're now looking over at the level of ha a pod. So like, basically, the things that Matthias was going over, for those, we were accessing the API server to get those different types of metrics, like whether or it was like using Headlamp or things, just a bunch of different those tools. So now we're going to go at the pod level of things. So if you think back to the diagram that we had a bit earlier with all the different levels there. So basically, um, there was this idea that with a pod, you can have multiple containers within that. and Basically, with being able to do that, you can have this possibility of having a sidecar idea. So you can kind of see that here. You have your application, and then you have your pod. I mean, your proxy, not pod. <laughs> um, so this was a, a survey that Cilium did. It was asking what features of service mesh interest you the most. So some people may have expected things like rate limiting, circuit breaking, retries, just like specific things that maybe are like networking or whatnot, but actually turns out the one that people were most interested in is observability. So basically like there's just so many different things that you can like look at and you need to care about. And based on that, we can use service mesh also for observability. So to like start at the like a pretty high level. Um, so with Kubernetes, again, like basically your base unit is a pod, and that is a wrapper around whatever container you have with your application. So this pod and therefore whatever containers are in it are connected to the network traffic. And then since we can have multiple containers in them, uh, these containers basically they share the same network address, and basically all the traffic that, say, the app on the left can see, so can the app on the right. 
It doesn't really make too much sense, though, to have multiple applications that are just separate running inside of a pod. Um, but we can use this idea for collecting network metrics. So instead, what we would do is that we would have one as our application and one as our proxy. And so basically, this proxy can go and listen and observe traffic. And basically, it can, can like collect um, some sort of network data. But it's not super useful if you only have this running inside of one of your pods. So the concept basically is that you, for anything that you care about learning more information about um, on the network, so you would have a proxy sitting in every single one of your pods. And so basically, you just have that there where each one of these is collecting network information for that specific pod. And then that is aggregated. And so that's collected on the control on the data plane, and it's all aggregated over onto the control plane. And then you can do things like applying pro uh, policies and rules to direct your traffic in some sort of way. You can see things like how long does a specific trip take and versus just like the whole entire thing. I mean, they, like having one little piece of like, I know it for this one thing, but what about from this part to this part and then this part to this other part? So the individual pieces don't know about it, but the control plane gets everything, and therefore you can get a whole picture from that. Um, so this a good thing here is that it is independent of whatever language or framework that you're using. You can basically you use it with any application that you can run on Kubernetes. So you, at this level, you can't get app-specific metrics, but you can get all of the different like network metrics for it. And it basically, it limits the depth of what you can see, but it makes it independent of what you are specifically running. And so one of the other nice things is, yes, I can go and I can add this to every single one of my pods. It doesn't do anything like, you don't have to change your application. It will end up restarting your pod, but you don't, like it's not, hey, I have to change the code in my application and then it breaks everything. And as a result, you can just go and remove it and again, you don't have to rebuild your application to be able to do that. This makes it so that you can try it out and decide, hey, yeah, this is ex I want this, I'm gonna keep using this, or decide, hey, I don't want to do that. So it just kind of, it depends on you for that. So basically, again, like all of this stuff uh, feeds into the control plane, and with that, you can get a bunch of information from that. So this is like, we'll actually look into this stuff since we have a bunch of time compared to a normal talk session. Um, so this is a screenshot from Kiali. Uh, who here has heard of Kiali? A lot of people, cool. Okay. All right, so basically uh, for those who haven't, um, it is a tool that's used for visualization for things specifically like Istio. So you can see in this one, you have like your Istio Ingress Gateway, this uh, lovely to-do application that Matthias created, <laughs> um, and you can see, for instance, like there's two separate versions there. Um, you have your UI, you have your backend, and then you have your database and having each of these separate pieces there. You can see things like the direction of like where is the traffic flowing with like the arrows. You can basically this can help you in a way to like figure out what exactly is happening. For instance, if you are missing an arrow between two parts of your application, obviously something is wrong there. Um, and then you can see like uh, error percentages and things like that. You can see basically for this one where it's point, version 0.2 and 0.3, you can see 86% is directed towards 0.2 and 13.1% is directed to 0.3. Things that you can't specifically do with Kubernetes. For instance, if you have a service and you have multiple pods, say you have three of them, you can it's split a third for each, but you can't be like, hey, I want to give this one 5% and then give this another percentage, whereas you can do percentage routing for things like this. And you can do things also, things like security as well, not just only observability, but that's just another like positive side effect. And you can see things like response time, and we'll, again, go into a bunch of that stuff afterward. Um, with this few components, it's questionable about whether you actually need a service mesh, but then there's things like this, which get a little bit more complicated. Um, so this is the visualization for uh, the Spring Pet Clinic, again, with not setting up Wavefront Proxy, so you see all this lovely red happening here, and then you can see uh, there will be 
a visualization later that will let you see traffic. So like, and then we have like the API gateway over there. We have the different components as well. Uh, so this was another, there was a study that the CNCF did. Um, not, the goal of our sharing this is not to compare Linkerd and Istio, but basically like we've seen a bunch of cool things of what service mesh can add, but there's, for with most things, there's pros and cons. Um, basically adding a proxy into every single one of these pods does add a lot of overhead. Um, it uses up more CPU, uses up more memory, and then therefore you may need more bigger nodes, which cost more money. There's things that you have like added latency because of all these additional network hops. And basically it's just something that you should look into when considering whether you want to use a service mesh. And basically just as a reminder again, if it ends up being maybe too expensive or just whatever reason you decide, hey, this is not for me, you can just go ahead and remove the proxies and your application still works as it was before. Um, this may have improved a little bit over time because as it has been previously pointed out when we showed this, um, 2021 was a little bit ago now. Time kind of just moves fast nowadays. Um, but yeah, so just kind of like to summarize a little bit. Um, so service meshes basically extends Kubernetes for limitations and network traffic awareness and shaping capabilities. It, for this one specifically with the pods, like there's a concept of you have a sidecar that is a proxy that you're inserting into every single one of your pods to be able to get information like on the network traffic for your whatever you were adding it to basically. And you don't have to do any changes to your application or to the application container in order for this to work. Again, it just, all it does is it ends up restarting your pod if you go and add or remove the proxy. And then one of the, I guess, maybe downsides or things that it doesn't do is that you can't get application level metrics. So, yeah. All right. Um, we still, I mean, we're an hour in. We can start a demo now. <laughs> you feel like? Do people want a break or do they want, do you want more demo time? So thumbs up on break. Okay, thumbs up on more demo time. Okay, you win. But uh, we, we're not going to do it, I mean, yeah, um, we're probably going to do this for like 20 minutes, half an hour or so, um, and then we're certainly going to take a 50 minutes break. So, <coughs> okay, do you want to go? Sure. Yes. Good. My <laughs> demo. <laughs> I'm not going to touch it. Okay, cool. So. All right, so yeah, demo time, which we'll see how it works. Um, okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is figure out where this is. All right, cool. Okay, so first I need to actually have Istio. Um, for, by default, uh, if we actually just go back to K9S, if we go, whoop. how do I get out of here? What do you want to do? Come back. Just show the pods, or go out, 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 out leave the program. Uh, no. No. Okay. Whatever. Yes. This. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm new to K9S. I should know. Okay. So and all right. So if we look here right now, if we scroll through, or even if I just specifically were to look at namespaces. Um, we can see here that I don't have anything specific with Istio. Um, so basically what we can do is we can, if I go back over here, um, if I do a curl, uh, we could go and uh, download Istio. So if I do this one here, and if I grab this, but I'm going to change it to one, the latest one last I checked was 119.0. So if we go and do, pull that down, yeah, so for those who raised their arms before, I said they have heard about Service Mesh but never used it. Yeah, we're going to do like the installation now. So first part will be the, the control plane and the components itself. And, and after that, we're going to inject the, the sidecars into the application and show you like how it starts collecting the metrics. All right. Cool. So then if we do an install, oh, German keyboard. 
Okay, so basically, yeah, let's see. That did not do it. Okay. You can just do Istio CTL. Um, yeah. yeah, except for... There we go. Okay. That looks good. So, yeah, basically we're using the uh, Istio CTL that we just pulled down and install. And if we do that... So then we can see as it's going through, there's things like Istio D, we, uh, Istio Core. Basically, it's going through and installing a bunch of different things with that. Um, afterwards, there's a bunch of different add-ons that we are going to go and add as well. So, so as we mentioned Kiali before, the Kiali would be one of those add-ons. So, Whoops. <laughs> keyboard. I'm blaming it on the keyboard and not myself. OK, so we can see things here that are starting to come up. So under we have Istio system now. We have the Istio Ingress Gateway. We have Istio D. And let's see. OK, cool. So we can see that those things are in, now installed. So then I'm going to go and add the add-ons. Or OK, so there we go. OK, so we can see that it is adding a bunch of different things here. So we have new service accounts being created. So now we have a different ver thing of Grafana here. So we had the one that was with the Prometheus stack. We're having that here as well. It's adding things with uh, tracing. So like there's Zipkin, there's Jaeger. Um, we have Kiali that's here. Um, and things with like Loki as well. So there's a bunch of different things that got added. So if we look over here, we can actually see as these things are slowly coming up and running. And then, so basically, before, like, you can see that we just had the little part with, like, the Q Prometheus stack. And so, like, these two different parts of Grafana are se running separately, which I can show in a little bit. But basically, uh, the thing, all those dashboards that we could see with the Q Prometheus stack are not going to necessarily be over here as well. So if we were to go to, let's see. I mean, I should probably say at this point, the, the, why we're doing it this way is we demo the individual toolings um, in, in, in a separated manner. Uh, if you would set this up in a clean kind of way, you, you would probably be better off having one Prometheus and, and one Grafana on top of that, and not like separate <laughs> ones in each and every namespace. But we just like, um, yeah, here it's like just, quick demo time, and later on we want to remove it again. Um, so this is certainly not best practice to have them all separated in that way. It's just like, this is the way it's going to be set up if you take that default add-ons installation. You can certainly, if you have an existing one, you can configure it to integrate into that. You will also see later on that in OpenTelemetry, we've got the same com components again. <laughs> so we basically have three Prometheus and three, and three Grafanas. But yeah, th that's basically the, re the reason behind it. Yeah, and then of course you could just do the uh, if you did a dash n um, istio system. Wait. Oh my gosh. You can tap it auto completes maybe. No. Nope. Escape. <laughs> okay, so you can also look at it here and see basically all the different things that got created with the pods and whatnot there. Okay, so I also didn't memorize every single thing here. Okay, so now I'm going to do get the ingress domain. So if I do this. Okay, so here we're also using the JSON path and then getting that. And then we're going to have the using nip.io again. So I can go ahead and uh, get this. So then basically I'm also going to go and next to configure an ingress gateway. I mean, you can do a bunch of different things with port forwarding, et cetera, for things, but that doesn't really get you far with this. So I'm going to go and actually use env subst for this, but not this one. The one above. Yeah. OK. So yes. I'll show this in a sec. Just as a, a quick side note here. I mean, you have seen before, I, I'm not sure how familiar you are with that ingress control and ingress concept. So I've installed the default ingress with this, the Nginx that we deployed all the sample applications to. But if you install Istio, 
Um, it comes like the, the base installation comes with the Istio daemon, which is like the control plane, and an own uh, ingress controller from Istio. So just to show you that, we, d we basically bind now the, 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 the URL configuration of the Istio component also to the Istio uh, ingress controller. We could use the Nginx for that as well, but just like basically to show you both. Yeah, so the file that I just used, um, it basically, if we just jump back here, we can see that there's a bunch of gateways, virtual services, and destination rules, which are a bunch of different like Istio specific CRDs that are, they're using for uh, creating specific resources. Um, if we look over here, we can see just basically it's just filling in that ingress domain um, and, and it's creating all these different resources, things for Kiali, um, things for Grafana, um, and then I actually I'll show that in a second here. Okay. So basically if we were to do like a cube, let's see, so gateway. Okay. So if you do this, you can see the gateways, the virtual services and the destination rules. So if earlier we did a get ingress, for instance, and you could see the things that we're using just like regular ingress with uh, Nginx and having the uh, host that there for this you with istio you would get the virtual service and then you can see the ones that we have here so for instance if we go and copy the one for kiali and then go here <laughs> yes i would like to leave thank you Okay, so this is the first page that you end up on if you enter with Kali. You can see a bunch of different namespaces um, for Istio system since it is part of Istio. You can get things like some of the metrics with that. Um, if you look at some of these other ones, I don't know if you can read it, but it probably doesn't help too much. Um, so there's like, these are the different namespaces. We have defaults, distro list, ingress, nginx. Um, we can see it currently just says that there is no inbound traffic because based on how it is set up, we aren't specific there's we don't have proxies sitting around in any of these like it can tell there's applications but it can't actually get any of the network information based on that one okay so if i were to like for instance go and look at for a graph if i were to pick um having this uh to do app we can see right now it j says that there's an empty graph we can't actually see things there um, there's different sections here that we can look at so there's applications we can see that there's three pieces here. If you look over here, you can, I, if let's make this a little bigger. Um, we can see that it is complaining, saying that there is a missing sidecar. So it actually knows that you don't have that there. Um, there's other things like workloads. You can see a little bit more information there. Um, there's services as well. Then there's also things that you can go into for uh, Istio config. So like if I were to look at Istio system, um, we can see all the different ones that we have here for like the destination rules, the gateways, and the virtual services, and things that you could set up based on routing um, things for your own application. Okay, so right now, if we look, for instance, at Istio system, we can see that since I'm currently on Kiali, um, we ha that's the extent of what I can see of connecting to the Ingress gateway, and I'm playing around with it. Um, if we were to go back over to the to-do app, um, what I'm going to go do now is I'm going to actually add a proxy within one of the pods that we have for that. So if you do a cube cuddle get deployments, let's actually I'm going to get rid of that for now. Okay, so people are probably familiar with this one where you. Uh, just get the YAML. It gives you a, it's dash o YAML and gives you all the YAML. Um, so basically, there is with Istio Cuddle um, or CTL or however you all pronounce it, depending. I assume it's different from different parts of the room or whatever. Um, you can actually inject uh, YAML. You can add YAML into the existing YAML that's specifically adding all the things that you need for Istio. So if I were to do that, uh, let's see. We'll get used to your setup one day. You just press enter now and yep. 
the arrow up. So then yeah, I've got it back. Yeah. There we go. No. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I only recently started playing this laptop, so <laughs> things are a little complicated sometimes. But um, basically, we can see there's a bunch of stuff here that's added for init containers, Istio IP tables, um, a bunch of environment variables, basically just a bunch of things here for basically adding all of the things that you need for having your proxy in there, which is nice. You don't have to manually go and do all of that. If I were to just go and do that, and then we can do a basically pipe that into kube cuddle apply. So if I go ahead and do that, if I look over here, um, if I go down, whoops. Also, his scroll is the opposite of mine, so that's a thing too. Um, OK, so we can see here that it has a pod initializing. So if we go and look into this, um, we can see that there was a completed Istio init that happened before. And then now we can also actually see that there is an Istio proxy that was not there before. If we were to go back and look at, say, the back end, for instance, um, we can see that there's only uh, one, pot, uh, one container that is running in this. And that's just the application part there. So if we were to go back over here right now, if I change this to every 10 seconds, but basically we have this proxy, but there is nothing that's actually happening. We're, we're not actually doing anything, so it still thinks that it's completely empty. So if I were to go over here and do uh, get ingress, so then we have our application here. So this is uh, Matthias's adorable um, <laughs> to-do app. Uh, we can add some sort of thing here, and like um, I don't know. Let's say, sir, yeah, I started typing this. Survive this deep dive because you are all stuck here for three hours unless you decide to leave early. But thanks for staying. So I'm just gonna go and add this, um, and then sure, I'll just add something to test. And I can mark it or whatnot. So if we go here, um, we can see basically that there's a, a little, a few parts here. So we have this uh, to do UI part here, and then we can see that it hits the back end, but it complains with here. If you were to click on it, um, for the, it says that it has a, it's missing a sidecar. Um, so basically, you can only like there's. If you remember from a little bit earlier, there's uh, three parts here. There's also the database. Right now, it has no idea that there is a database. Um, so you can. There's only just. Hey, I I assume it's hitting. The, I know it's hitting this point, but that's kind of as far as I can go. Um, we can add things like what is like the response time. We can add things like. Uh, let me change this for like the last five minutes. OK, so if we have things like the response rate, we can have traffic rate. There's a bunch of other things that you can have here, throughput, traffic distribution. And I'm not sure if you can see it, but it's like on the arrows now, you can see those metrics. Um, make it maybe a little, little bigger. OK. So when, uh, when you yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> nope. All right. Zooming is hard. As soon as I zoom a little too far, all right, there we go. OK, so yeah, basically, you can see, for instance, uh, the code might be a little broken for this app. So uh, you can see that there is a 50% error rate, for instance, there. Um, and then basically, there's you have your service. Uh, and then now it's just like, hey, what's happening next over here? OK, so if I go back to the last minute again, empty graph because there is no network traffic that's actually happening on this. So um, what we could do is we could actually go and there's a few things. One, if you wanted to, we could just go and generate some sort of load for it. Um, I'm going to actually go and copy that because. Wait, it's, it's actually, yeah. I think mm -hmm. it's already open. The load? Uh, yeah, go on this tab. Um, yeah, I guess you are generating. OK. But this was pointing, I think, to the other to the wrong, wrong IP. Yeah. Um, you can. Do you want to do it or should I do it? <laughs> I can. I'm as, I'm as tall as you are now. Um. Yeah, so we're running this on our demo cluster that we were doing earlier. So now we have a new URL. So it's on. So 
So this should put some constant load onto the application now. Um, where is the browser? Other way. Sorry. Yeah. All right, should, should pick up in a second. <coughs> but yeah, so basically, again, it just, now that we have that up again, we can see that it has load there. Okay, so basically, right now, again, we only have it on two parts. Uh, if we, w what we would want specifically for this one is that we could add it a proxy onto every single one of the pods that we have. So if I were to do uh, Istio Cuddle Jack. Okay, so we could do basically the same thing. Instead of giving it the specific deployment name, we could just give it deployments, and then that would add it to all of those. So if we end up going back here, um, we, can, we should be able to see soon enough, yeah, basically things are starting to terminate and recreate the pod that will end up having uh, two containers within those. And since we are just creating load, if we actually were to go here, the creating load basically is eventually it should start creating. Yeah, it just has a new to do, which is just something that shows up there and then goes away um, to add load to that. So if we were to go and refresh this, hmm. it will be there soon. <laughs> Demos. Is it, let, I guess let's double check whether all of these are, okay, so these are up and running. They each have two, so if we were to look at the back end, which we didn't have before, now we can still see that we have Istio, we have Istio proxy there. And then if we go here, okay, there we go. Um, let's see. Okay, so the fact that that's still not showing is kind of weird. It will probably... It's taking its sweet time, but basically, <laughs> It has one because now it knows that it's actually going and hitting the database that is at the end there. So we could also do this thing where if we have traffic animation, um, you can basically see that it's going in that direction. Like this is a pretty simple application. There's only three like components here. Um, the fact that by default, it originally it doesn't show this box around things. You need to have a, it's because there was a label that got added. Um, that was on the services. So basically, if we look over here, okay. So um, what we had just basically had done, which I guess I don't know why it's there. No, I, I know why it's there. I mean, we played through the demo before, <laughs> and we removed Istio and we remo removed the, the the proxies, but we re didn't remove like those things that how we patched the application and relabeled it because normally it doesn't look as like grouped nicely uh, in the beginning as we see it now, but this is just something that we've done already to the application before we injected the sidecars, and that already made it look uh, somewhat more beautiful in that, in that dashboard. I mean, if you haven't seen it before, you wouldn't notice. Normally, we do this step to basically show that change, but now it's already in place. I mean, effectively, it just says Istio is basically then able to pick up labels of your application, and if the labels of the application and the service are identical, it would like put a box around it and group it, and that makes it like more visual appealing to you, or like, more, more easier to identify, especially if the application is becoming uh, larger and more complex in, in its, uh, its behavior. So yeah, we have to. I mean, you have to skip. We're not, we're not going to yeah. unpatch it now. It's just we leave this it. This is what is. happens when you have multiple uh, clusters and maybe do things maybe on the wrong cluster, which I probably did this earlier. So hi. Um, all right. So then basically, so that was one way of going about doing it. Where basically, if we uh, look back here, it was using the Istio cuddle and then cube inject and then change like basically having a new YAML and applying that. Um, so another way to go about it is, and this time I'm just going to copy paste. So if we go back over here and we look over instead at uh, Spring Pet Clinic, again, we have an empty graph. I mean, we sh expect this because if we look, for instance, at applications, we can see all the different pieces here, but they are all missing a sidecar. Um, so if we go back over here, um, what we can do is we can actually go and create a label. So we have a label that is Istio injection and just enabled. And then we, so if we just go and do that. Um, we can see that pods are going away. Um, and 
then it's going to go and create new ones. If we, for instance, go back at K9S, um, we can see that all of that is happening with uh, the different pods that are there. It takes a bit of time. I'm also going to, as a result, uh, do this for OpenTelemetry as well. And I should probably say at this point, this is probably the, the, the recommended way of doing that. I mean, as you have seen before, um, the, the configuration, of course, depends on the individual instrumentation. And, and if you forget some kind of pods, then what you're going to see up in Kiali might not actually be the thing that, that you want to see, and it, it might give you results which are not actually, um, which are not actually correct. So injecting individual pods with, uh, with Istio CTL is doable. But normally, you probably would want to say, OK, I, I don't want to monitor the entire cluster. I might, I might limit it to this namespace, and then all the applications that connect within that namespace should be injected. And then a, s a single label only on the namespace would be, would be sufficient. So whenever a pod starts in that namespace, it will check, OK, is that, is that label set? And if it's set, it's going to add the sidecar pro proxy. And if it's not set, it's going to start it without it. So that also makes it easier later on to, to remove it. So you just like, uncheck the labels, restart the pods again, and then the sidecars are out. OK. Yeah, so like the other one, I mean, it was useful in the sense of I could add the proxy. But again, like he was saying, you're basically manually adding it to every single pod that you want it on. That's not great because, say, if you want it for an entire namespace and you forgot one of them, then you have to go and see, oh, hey, I forgot, or you might not even notice until later. Instead, with the label, any new one, anything that a new pod that gets added to that namespace will end up having that there. Um, so, based on the way that it's set up for a Spring Pet Clinic, um, originally you can see just like that there's a communication between the API gateway, this thing called pass through cluster, and wavefront proxy. Um, if we go back over to, yeah, and then there's uh, also things that are showing up there. If we look at the web page, so if we do, okay, get ingress again, or not ingress, a uh, virtual service. No, no, it's, no, it's, it's ingress, ingress but they, they, they do all namespaces. Oh, right. Oh, no. German keyboards. <laughs> Oh, no. Well, do, yeah, yeah. Do, control C first, yeah. I'm just going to do it this way. Yeah. OK, there we go. So Spring Pet Clinic. We go here. Um, some of you may have seen this page before. Uh, so I'm just going to click on around on different things to uh, generate some sort of traffic. I'll click on some names. Um, we can like edit pet. Still dog. Um, we can, uh, let's see, if I go to all and then click a random person, we're going to add a pet. I don't know. Matthias is now a pet. <laughs> and sure, you're a hamster. Okay. That was my dream for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Something shorter than me. I mean, it's, why not? I need a bigger box then. Uh, yeah, so if we look here, um, it's a little confusing at this level, but if you start zooming in, um, we can see, again, since Wavefront Proxy isn't set up, we can see all this traffic that is failing. Um, we can see that's 100% error rate. We can see now that we've hit a bunch of different endpoints. We've seen uh, visits. We've seen there's customer, ser there's customer service. There's vets. And um, again, if traffic, if I'm, it's refreshing constantly, uh, traffic no longer shows. So if we have in the last five minutes, um, the way that this is set up is that there are two different versions. So we can see that there's a two different versions that are communicating along specifically with that. So you, basically, this was one of the screenshots earlier. It's just a little bit more complicated looking uh, than we had with our single pathway of the to-do application. Um, we can see other things over, oh my goodness. The mouse. Actually, so if we were to actually quickly switch back over to the to do app, and then, yeah, last five minutes, for instance, uh, we can see like things that there's different colors here based on what, uh, like whether it's successful or not. You can see what the different errors there's inbound, outbound, um, and just like a bunch of different things that you can see with it. If we were to now switch over to open telemetry, which Let's see, that should. Check again, uh, like to like last minute or so. 
Um, hmm. Can you check if it got instrumented properly? Mm, different cluster? Did, maybe you didn't execute. Well, you did. Um, it says for some reason that this is not. It's on the wrong cluster again. Of course. <laughs> yep. Oh, that's also. Ex okay. <laughs> I could have sworn that I read that it said DevOps, but apparently not. Demos are hard. <laughs> Yeah, but it's like a proof that we really <laughs> try to do everything live here. There's nothing, <laughs> nothing fake in this setup. Uh, it's just get, it's getting kind of messy with all the various URLs and, and endpoints. If we normally, if we only demo it, we set it up prior, and then we can use bookmarks. But this is unfortunately not not possible now. So yeah. Yeah. So just like looking into this now with Open Telemetry, there's a bunch of different pieces. Later, um, Tietz is going to actually go dive into OpenTelemetry. We can see it's adding these sidecars. Only a few of them right now are still saying that it's missing a sidecar. So if we look back over at the graph. It will start building up now. So I mean, the, the, one of the advantages of this demo is there is like a built-in load generator um, that Which will constantly right here. generate traffic. Um, this is something we don't have here for the Spring Pet Clinic, and that's why we would just have manually click on the um, on the on, on the on the on the web page all the time. But it's actually interesting to see how the individual components now pick up, and 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 also of course we Tiffany said it before in the uh, in the slide deck already. Obviously that the the Spring Pet Clinic was all built in Java, the, the to do application that I did as well. But this one is totally polyglot, um, and and that again shows that this sidecar like um, injection is totally independent of your um, application language or, or framework. So you can add it to anything which is containerized um, as it only operates on, on the network level. And this is kind of the, yeah, the important thing to understand here. This is what the metrics that you get, and this is all the limitations that, that you already also have. And you can slowly see it just keeps getting more and more pieces and more complicated. And like if you were to zoom in further, um, like for instance, if we were to click here, um, we can see that this is a collector and that every single thing is uh, pointing over to that. And again, more things, more and more things keep getting added. If you, you can just basically, and then we have your front end, uh, you have front end proxy. Basically, you kind of, the fact that I'm zoomed in right now especially makes it a little hard to tell what's happening. But you can see all those same things that are uh, you could for the other applications there, just with a much, much more complicated application. And now if we actually zoom out, what, since everything should be there, it's uh, some sort of chaotic looking ship a little bit. <laughs> Anyways, what's also pretty worth to mention, I think the other two applications are only based on HTTP and REST communication. So this one also does gRPC. Um, some of the components also do REST, um, but this is also being, being collected and oh, no. <laughs> being collected and dis displayed here. So you get the, 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 like the throughput, latency, error rate, um, but you can't drill in any deeper. So you can't really say, okay, this is the error that I see now. Um, what is actually the root cause of that? So this is kind of where at least the, the visualization in, in Kiali ends. These are metrics that you would probably have in, um, um, in, in Prometheus, but they are not being, being displayed here. I think this is a good point for a break. Yes. <laughs> okay, so it is, um, what is the time now? It's, it's five past three. So we say like 20 past three, we're gonna continue here. Um, we're still gonna continue on that a little bit, then show you monitoring with Cilium and the Hubble UI, and uh, also Jaeger and Open Telemetry is, is still about to come. So yeah, enjoy your break and feel free to come back. <laughs> Yeah, so while people are still coming back, and actually, thanks a lot for coming back. This means a lot to us. Uh, I might just do like a, a quick recap again um, to, to summarize what we saw. So now, in the beginning, we saw with like no in intrusiveness of whatsoever, um, we could query high-level metrics. Now, um, this is of course changed the game quite a bit, because if you just like expand here. You can see all the various network metrics you are now able to, to, to grab and, and, and visualize with this kind of tooling.
But on the other hand, you also saw that, of course, the, the, the changes, uh, th there are some changes that you have to make now. So the, the, on the good side of things, you don't need to rebuild your apps, you don't need to rebuild your containers, but there are components to be added um, in, in form of the, the sidecar proxies. And so you have technically one restart uh, when adding them. This is something you need to consider, but I don't find that so hard. The other thing is, of course, the, the overhead that, you pro that you're going to get by, by using this. So out of this, a, um, I'm going to hand over to Tiffany again for um, showing us another, I just want to switch this real quick, kind of technology that plays now a role in that service mesh space. OK, so who here has heard of eBPF? OK, like maybe a fourth of the room. OK, cool. Well, I'll ask that question again later, <laughs> see if you're paying attention at all. Um, yeah, so basically what we were talking about is uh, things that were pod-based, again, where you're adding a proxy inside of every single pod. Um, for this one, we are not worrying about that level of things. We're worrying about the node level. So eBPF stands for Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. Um, it has key little B. If you hear things about Cilium, you may have heard the, um, it in terms of like eBPF. So if we look at this diagram here, or I guess cute visualization that Matthias made um, again, so previously, just as a recap, we had looked over at the level of the API server. We had looked at things at the level of the pod. Um, so this one, instead, we are looking at the level of the nodes. So basically, it's a pretty, for eBPF things, it's a pretty low level functionality. So you have like the kernel space. So this is basically where your kernel software runs. It's usually a pretty protected environment. Um, it's also pretty difficult to change. So there was a, in a previous talk that we had seen there, I wish we had grabbed the graphic, but basically it's this fun thing of like, here is the time frame of, I want to put something into the Linux kernel and maybe it'll eventually get approved in like a year or something. And then it'll maybe like be out and available for people to use like five years from now. That's not really going to work um, in this type of scenario. Um, the th and the things that like people generally are interacting with is over on the other side, which is like the user space. So this is things that you're normally trying to change. There's things like over that you can send over with like, you have SDKs, you have libraries, you have tools over there. Like one view that, one way people have described it is basically that it's comparable to JavaScript in a web page. Um, this is basically what the eBPF sandbox is in the kernel. You can run custom code, but you can't harm the environment. You don't have to worry about like just destroying everything. Uh, seeing that yesterday or today, when we were practicing the demo, I accidentally just deleted the entire to-do application instead of what I was trying to do. So bad things can happen, and you don't want that happening in this kind of thing. And so basically, in the kernel space, it can uh, interact with kernel events, such as network events. So when we looked previously at like the Kubernetes infrastructure, we could see the split between the control plane and the worker nodes. Previously, we we're getting all that information from the control plane. So if you think about the diagram again of where we have all of our pods with our applications and our proxies, all of those were going down to the control plane. This time, we are going to be looking at a different place. We're going to be looking specifically at the Kubernetes worker nodes, which again is where all of your applications are running. So this is basically a view of what your nodes look like. So you have at the bottom, you have the operating system, you have your container daemon, which th there's things like Docker, you have your kubelet, you have your kube proxy, and then on top of that, you have your containers that are running there. Um, the majority of the time, it seems nowadays at least, since it started off that way, um, you're probably using it with Linux. There's actually some work being done that we heard recently about things in e the realm of eBPF to do with Windows, but that's still a work in progress. Um, but basically, so since you're using, you have the operating system in the node, and via eBPF, you can inject code to query metrics. So instead of like top level abstractions and like collecting at that level, you're going beneath it, like. All of the container traffic eventually goes through the network interface of the underlying node, and this is where it ends up being intercepted. So since 
uh, your containers are dealing with Linux, you have your kernel, and then you're dealing with Linux with eBPF, you can be able to get um, information on the network based on that. So if we, it's kind of, this diagram is kind of similar to what we were seeing um, previously with the pod-based service mesh. Um, so instead of like, so you have your uh, eBPF control there, which is in the control plane, that is going to go and be aggregating your information. But instead of running again on your within your pod, uh, you have it on each of your nodes. So say we have three nodes, then we have it on each one of those. And a, I would guess uh, that you probably have fewer nodes than you have pods. Be a little strange otherwise. So therefore, it, you have maybe a little bit less overhead and just like less there. Since instead of like say you have thousands of pods. For every single one of those pods, then you need to have your proxy here. If I have like 10 nodes, then you just have to add things there. Um, this is a little diagram basically of things for uh, Spring Pet Clinic um, using Hubble. So Hubble is basically the Kiali. Uh, so Kiali for Istio, we have Hubble for looking at things there with Cilium for it. So it kind of looks similar. Um, I'm actually going to go and show that in a bit, but basically you get like a traffic flow view. You can see like what different pieces are talking to the others, just kind of like how we were before. Um, what you aren't directly getting though from this dashboard that we could see with Kiali is like things like response times and throughput, but Cilium does have those types of things. It just doesn't show up as far as I'm aware in this diagram, but you can see a bunch of this type of stuff uh, via Grafana. Um, still with things with Cilium, like there's the response time info at the top there, like there's for overall crust, and then below you can see a different sort of trace view. And actually when Matthias goes into open telemetry, there'll be not specifically for this one, but there'll be things with tracing as well. So like these Grafana dashboards, which I'm not going to be showing, um, basically can be used to like visualize this data. You can see like how long some sort of call takes. You can see this break I will kind of see, I mean, there's different colors and things are moving, but like a uh, tracing breakdown of the components within your application and it together, these things basically match what you could see in Kiali. And like we've been talking mostly about open source projects. Um, Cilium also has like an open source core, but there's also a licensed version. I'm not entirely sure where the breakpoint between open source and uh, paid product is, but um, that's something I guess we and other folks can look into. All right, so if I go back over to here, or where is, there we go. Okay, so if we do, uh, I'm just going to do a k get ingress dash a. So if I look here, I have Hubble. Okay, so if we look on the main page here, it's different. We don't have the way that the namespaces were shown in Kali. Here you can see a bullet point list of all of the namespaces that we currently have. Obviously this can end up being a lot if you have a lot more. There is also a way to click it here. If we were to look at things like cube system, we can see that we have things specifically with Hubble. Um, we have cube DNS. And then we can see that it's communicating with the Prometheus from Cube Prometheus stack. We can also see our Ingress Nginx for our Nginx Ingress controller. If we go and looked at Istio's system, um, there's a lot <laughs> happening here. It's kind of chaotic at the moment um, because basically we have like our Istio Ingress gateway, we have Kiali, we have Jaeger and Istio D. And then because OpenTelemetry has a lot of stuff, we can see all of those things basically connecting with that. If we were to look at Ingress like Nginx, that's a lot less complicated. We have our Hubble UI, our to-do UI, and then just the Ingress. I mean, one, what's interesting to say here as well, of course, it, from a conceptual perspective, it works in the same way that it, that it intercepts that network traffic. And you can see here, as long as there is no traffic, it's not able to display any kind of lines. Um, it just remembers those components that had a connection there before. 
and 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 also compared to to Istio or service meshes before, right now we don't have to break it down and say we want to enable it for this namespace or for this pod. It's just going to be like on and off for the cl entire cluster in general, and hence you're going to just see the connections in in any namespace without the need to configure them individually. So depending on what you want, say if you only wanted it for like specific components, well you can't like you can't really do that so much here you get everything but it's also so much easier in a way where you literally get everything and you don't have to do it for all this namespace or this pod and all those specific things um if we were to go and look for instance at our spring pet clinic um this again looks kind of similar to what we're having um before um we can see that if I can zoom properly, um, we have like our API gateway. We can see that it communicates with different components that are inside of like for a spring play kind of so like the vet service. Um, we have our customer service things. You can, things are just like a little confusing looking sometimes depending on arrows and such. Um, we can see like database things. Um, if you look down here, you can see, uh, I'm not sure how visible it is. Zooming in doesn't help too much, um, but you can see like the source service. We can see what its destination is. You can see what port that's on. You can see that it's forwarded and a timestamp based on that. But basically, like this is very similar uh, to what we were seeing with Kali. There's a few things that you can't necessarily do that you could do with um, that one, but you also didn't have to go and add uh, labels and whatnot to a bunch of different things here to be able to see what's happening. And also this whole Cilium stuff with like eBPF technology and things in this realm um, like is a lot newer in the Kubernetes space than um, pod-based service mesh has been previously. All right, so. Okay, so just to give like a high level overview of this stuff. So basically, um, instead of having some sort of proxy component that you are injecting into every single one of your pods, um, you have things on the node level instead. Um, it's using a Linux low level functionality that, and this is like specific, the way it's been created here, is specifically leveraged for Kubernetes observability. Um, it's pretty fast growing in the CNCF landscape. Um, actually, who here has n heard of CNCF? Okay. Should be a few. <laughs> so yeah, that's the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So that uh, diagram from earlier of a bunch of projects and a bunch of cool open source things. Um, so basically, like you're, st we're still having it where our application and the application container aren't touched. We can't see specific metrics for those things with it. Um, that's what the next section is on. Um, and then you basically just need to configure the cluster once. Again, you don't have the, I just created a new namespace. Oh no, I need to go and do labels. I need to do this thing to be able to actually get information on it, those new things that I added to the cluster. It is just already there. So yeah. All right. Yeah, I um, just wanna, yeah, I just realized um, that we kind of skipped something in, in our demo today because this is the first time we're doing it in that way that we set up all the components, and we did not set, we didn't show you the setup um, for this. Um, there's the, and there's a bit of a reason for that, um, and also in comparison to to, to um, Istio, for example, Istio is a lot easier to add to a cluster or to an individual namespace at a later point in time. This one is something you normally do right in the beginning, after or when setting up that cluster. So, I mean, you can potentially do it at a later point in time, but this will definitely have a disruption on all of the components because, like, the, the nodes have to, be, uh, have to be updated, and this will affect all the containers there. So, yeah, uh, what is better, what is worse, it is, this is kind of hard to say. It's really, as, as Tiffany said, the concept is kind of the, the same. It's just right here, you put the agent on a node and collect the network traffic there, and the other one you collect next to the, to the application containers and collect it there. Um, yeah, and, and this has certainly triggered quite a bit of uh, things in the past. So in the last two years, this was definitely one of the hot topics around the, the KubeCon conferences, and this gained a lot of, gained a lot of traction. Um, and also this, we don't have that in the slide, but we should potentially mention this, that's that Istio also goes in the direction to, to build now this the service mesh in an ambient way. So that also means um, not having to install sidecars. So I think 
we in the end will benefit from all this evolution. Right now, it's kind of hard to say wh who is going to like win in the end. But uh, anyways, I think the 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 idea of a service mesh is great because it, it helps a lot in network management in distributed environments. Maybe the sidecar thing was the way to get it started, but now having this sidecar less will, will make the world probably easier for us as consumers, and um, this is certainly interesting to see um, where this is going to go. And, and again, if you want to configure it, um, there are different instructions for various cluster types. So our demo clusters today um, are provided by Azure, um, and th there are certain instructions for Azure or Google Cloud and, 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 and others how you would con uh, configure Cilium um, right at start. And the good thing is once it's in there, then it's, it's going to work and you can just ex exploit it afterwards without changing anything. Actually, I think um, some of the major cloud providers, at least Azure, offers this also now as already an, 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 a, a, an integral part of the service. So if you like, get an AKS cluster, you can also say, I want this Cilium enabled, and then you don't have to worry about the setup then by yourself. All right, so that's that. Um, there's and a question. Oh, there's a question, yeah. Well, I mean, there certainly is, um, especially, um, yeah, f the Cil I say Isovalent, the company behind Cilium, they, they are driving this thing quite a bit. And they have definitely released certain kind of benchmarks, how much this will affect versus a service, uh, um, a sidecar-based one. We don't really would want to go into this direction too much. Um, same thing as we had before, we didn't want to compare like uh, Istio and LinkedIn. Um, just, just saying that there will be something. From, from what we've heard so far, the impact of that is, is less as an overhead compared to a sidecar-based side -based thing. Um, how much it adds on total, on top, it's always hard to measure because it will depend, I mean, yeah, how many nodes do you have, how does your application structure look like, and, and network connectivity. Um, but yeah, if you, uh, Cilium has certainly released a couple of uh, benchmarks on that in the past. So that's where I would start looking. We, we don't have anything on that here in the presentation. And in general, I mean, thanks for like, asking something. This is, you're invited, of course, to do, all, uh, to do that all. Um, we have more time today than normal, and we're definitely happy to, to go into, into more questions. All right. So with that, we kind of come to the, the final part of the, of the presentation. Um, and like, let's say, all the, the, the deepest form um, of observability here. So it might look kind of tiny on that slide, uh, because now we have this magnification glass within the application. But this is certainly the one which kind of has the most impact um, on basically setting up the, the, the infrastructure for, um, for, for monitoring. So yeah, we, we're going to try to go into the application and finally also grab application metrics. Um, and yeah, that, so to put it in perspective with all the others, so we could say with the API server kind of thing, we were able to like sense or like get to know that some things not, might not be okay. Um, splitting it down on a network level, we could say, okay, we can now isolate and maybe pinpoint um, which is the problematic component in our chain of components. Um, and now we want to basically do root cause analysis and figure out where in the application are actually things going wrong. So, um, yeah, from, a, from an infrastructure perspective, this looks in a similar way. The agent is now placed here. This will send the metrics to a database, and we have various forms um, of observability on dashboards to, to display that. And this is actually one of the big problems. There are probably too many different forms. So this is a, a setup we're going to see today, for example, like open telemetry on the agent side, sending things to Prometheus and then to Grafana. There is also, most people have probably heard of, of an ELK stack. Um, you can also of course, combine these, then, for example, take FluentD and um, get the logs from there and also send it to Elasticsearch, and various different combinations of monitoring tools and, and monitoring formats. This was, uh, or it still is probably, a big pain point in this, uh, in this entire uh, realm of things. Um, and that's why I definitely want to highlight open telemetry a little bit today, uh, because, yeah, this is a bit of a, uh, I'd say, a very healthy evolution, in my opinion, as opposed 
to the to the other developments around the technologies um, for Kubernetes. I mean, we've seen the landscape before, and I've, I've been watching this landscape over time quite a bit, and the only thing you can say, it's constantly getting bigger. It makes it really harder to um, for, for the end users to pick and say, this is the thing that I want, what, what is basically maintained well, what is mature, and so on. They have some certain criteria around that, but in the end, you will probably have to, to play around it and, 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 and um, find it out for yourself. Now, open telemetry is actually ki kind of combining uh, a couple of already existing solutions into one. So it's basically kind of standardizing in that field. The way it works from a high-level perspective, and we already got a bit of an indication on that when we looked at the Kiali dashboard before, like there's this central component, which is the open telemetry collector. Um, and that can basically get the information from various sources. Sources that basically speak that open telemetry protocol. That can be applications um, that have open telemetry agents or API. This is what we're going to look into. That can also be other components like Kubernetes clusters, uh, proxies, infrastructure from, from clouds, and so on. So these are all going to be collected, and they kind of then standardized on this open telemetry collector level. And from there, it can be exported to different visualization, um, let's say, endpoints. And this is the good thing that also most of the, let's say, commercial vendors have agreed on that standard. So the competition is now not being made on the, on the level where the metrics are being queried, but much more on the side where they're being evaluated. And that also makes it easier for us as an end user to say, OK, this is the functionality that I want to have. Uh, but, in, but I don't see the competition in the, in the, in the, in the level where they are, the metrics are being collected. This is ba becoming more and more a standard using open telemetry. Right, so we're going to definitely look a bit uh, into the, the field of Java, um, because now we are on application level. Now, basically, the agent needs to know uh, what is the application language, what would I want to monitor, how do I find the key metrics, and so on. Anyways, um, open telemetry covers more than that. Um, so on the left side, you basically can see um, this is from the, from, from directly from the website. Those languages are currently supported. They have an, an own agent or agent libraries to, to be implemented and have the information queried. And a couple of them, like a small subset, also has automatic instrumentation. Um, and this is basically what we're going to look into, into first. And, and you can see Java is basically a part here. Why does this matter? Because for those with an auto instrumentation, you can basically still leave your code untouched, um, but still just add this auto instrumentation to it from the outside and don't have to rebuild and, and, um, and directly uh, attach to the source code. So, I'm going to show this later on live anyway, but um, just as, as a bit of an idea how that works. So this is like a, a Docker file um, where m like, most people would have seen like, how to it put a Java application in there and then um, execute the Java application. But the difference is here now, it downloads that open telemetry agent, and here it adds it to the, to the Java process. So basically, if I already have my char file, that is still good enough. I don't have to modify my code. I just add this additional library to the, to the Java process. F what that means in level of in, in, in intrusion, or how, I don't know how to say, you have to rebuild your container, of course, but you don't have to rebuild your application. Then, after the thing is being done, you need, of course, to configure it. So what it technically needs to know, where is my open telemetry collector? Um, and it has to pass kind of an ID to say, well, I'm application X or Y. So this is basically how, it, how things are going to show up later on in the, um, in the, in the traces. Um, but there, there's also different options. So uh, with, with this one, for example, this, uh, the sleuth component, you can, you can also add it into the code. Um, so in, in that kind, it means you add dependencies. But then you have to rebuild your, uh, your application and, of course, rebuild the container afterwards. Um, but the configuration is then afterwards pretty equivalent. Uh, you need to tell the, the component where is my collector, what is my name, and then it can, can process that. 
So same thing exists for Quarkus, of course. Same thing ex exists for Micronaut. So all the major um, frameworks are covered. And yeah, if I forget anyone, please please apologize. I didn't like work with all of them. Um, but this is like the equivalent configuration that we would use for um, um, for Quarkus here. All right. So I'm going to skip over this real quick. So we're talking about we'll talk about Jaeger briefly. Um, I mean, these are just like, okay, I, I can of course talk about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, JVM metrics that are being collected. Um, this is basically from inside of the application. Um, again, being rendered in a Grafana dashboard. So now we are able to get ch like Java garbage collection, heap size metrics, what, uh, whatever, uh, that we did not get before with the technologies that we have been used. All right. Now, Jaeger is also one of the, I think, graduated CNCF components. That has, this has been there for a while um, and has now gained a lot of new popularity by, by being like, uh, heavily used for open telemetry purposes. There is also a Jaeger installation that basically embeds the open telemetry collector. This is what I'm going to use in my demo later on. But yeah, Jaeger is not necessarily uh, only being used with open telemetry. So for example, in this screenshot, uh, you can see the, uh, the Jaeger in, um, configuration with data being collected from Istio. So that is also possible. And as you might have seen before, um, Istio comes with an own uh, Jaeger instance. And interesting to see, of course, there's like the, the UI call is like the, the outer call on that trace. And then there is this, the span beneath that for the call to the backend. Um, again, this is basically what you can expect from, um, from, from Istio. No insights from on the application itself, but basically the connection, when, when does it enter and when does it leave. Now, this is how it would look if you actually used an, an implementation like OpenTelemetry. Now you can suddenly not only see the entrance of a command, like via, via a get call, but now you actually see the methods being invoked inside of the application, and this includes, for example, the database call. And um, this is basically what I will try to show live here now. And of course, yeah, the more complex your application gets, um, the more sense this will make. So now you can very easily say, OK, this is my slow running part of the application. Uh, and why is that so? Or is that basically something I just need to live with? Because that's what the code really takes. All right. Now, um, as I have to. Um, as I as said before, um, this will require changes in the code and rebuild of the container. So for this purpose, I'm going to step away a bit from the doing everything in the Kubernetes cluster, as we have seen before, and do it in the first place with, a, with just a Docker Compose file on my, on my local environment. Um, in the end, when the containers are then being done, we we could, of course, push them to the Kubernetes environment, but if I have to do that for repeat it for every step, it might just mean we, 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 we lose a bit of time. So uh, for a quick look into that, how does it work? Um, again, we have like the Postgres database, the backend, the UI component, and then this um, Jaeger tracing. If we look at the applications itself, I mean, you have to get a bit of an idea. It's basically a, a REST controller with a couple of endpoints. So here we list the to-dos, and here we add new to-dos. It's nothing really fancy. Um, but later on, this is what we want to see, of course, um, in our traces. And also here in the, in the POM XML, it's now commented out. We don't have any kind of um, references to the open telemetry instrumentation. So if we look at the, the Docker file then, so this is basically, let's say, the, the original one, um, where I just uh, copy the char file in and then execute it. This is the way how it, how it would look um, with, the, um, with the instrumentation. Just one thing I should probably change. Um, normally, you wouldn't copy that file in locally, but you would actually add it this way, so you would always get the latest version. The reason why we did this, we did this demo last week in KubeCon Shanghai, and github.com didn't really make it through the grand Chinese firewall. Um, so we had to copy that in always locally after we had successfully downloaded it once. So um, that's the reason behind that. Just, um, yeah, 
don't don't ever say this is this is what you've seen from my side in a, in a Docker file. Um, all right, so the same thing here. And yeah, as I said, we don't have to rebuild the application. We probably have to build them in the first place once. Um, so this is the back end. And this is the front end. And now I'm going to build the containers. I just have a lot of other things in my chat history because yesterday I did, I did a talk on um, Docker builds. Um, So this one would use the original file and create the container. Uh, what is not there? I gotta type it out. Am I in the right directory? Okay. Okay. All right, so this has been built, and I'm going to do the same thing um, for the back end. All right, so this is like um, now all still in the uh, original version. Um, and if I start up the, the so to, to look at the, the, Docker, uh, the Docker Compose file again, um, now, this is what we have to do on that end. Um, we basically uh, pull, pull the image from there and then configure the various uh, properties. They will point to that, to that Jaeger instance, and they're going to pass that name. So this, this Jaeger instance down here um, would, is, is called the all-in-one instance or like version, which kind of embeds an um, open telemetry collector, and we have to enable it and set this to true. So let's just um, like do this. Um. Okay, this has to be done the other way around. Yeah, the, the docker compose command is not so flexible when it comes to that. All right, so there are a lot of logs outputs and now looking at things here. We see those things are running. We have the the backend, the UI, the Postgres, and the um, the Jaeger tracing. So I can access that from my. <laughs> Sorry, I, I probably need to rearrange my things here a little bit. So I'm gonna put this over there. and jumping in here. So this is what the, the Jaeger UI would then look like. Um, if I expand here on the services, um, this has already um, grabbed one of the components. Um, I still want to go and say, I want to generate some traffic on this. So this is the same thing now on a local level, and we can do the same things and test and should I do survive survive the deep dive again? I mean, we all we almost survived uh, it. Raider, talk at the end of this talk because that would be awesome. <laughs> Please and thanks. Okay, this is not our to do, but I can still put <laughs> it in there. Rate the talk. Um, and yeah, so by now, if I refresh that, I should probably say I have now three services: um, the to do back and the to do UI, and it it's also grabbing some own metrics from the Jaeger all in one. 
So if I click on to do backend and say find traces, then I will see, okay, I have this get call, I have a post call, here I have 10 spans, I have 13 spans. Or oh, let me delete one of the icons real quick. So I'm going to uh, do that, take that off. Uh, maybe that one too. And if I um, refresh it again, I also see now I have one with, with 15 spans. So if I click on that, I can now see, okay, um, this is the, the breakdown of the application. So there's an initial get call to my UI. And then it, it, it basically, I, see, I can see here now this is on method level. So if I go in there, I can also see who is basically picking up that, that value. So I, I've used the Open Telemetry Auto instrumentation, and here it's using the Spring Web MVC um, library to, to collect those metrics. As a background information, this is basically a thyme leaf based um, uh, website. And then it also goes over to, to, the, to the back end, um, which is basically another call there. And if I expand it here as well, um, I can get all the information. So, so here it's like the open telemetry Tomcat uh, part that is basically uh, collecting the info of, of the REST call. If I go further into, somehow it kind of got hung up now with the, so back here. Um, in here, it gets to, to the, um, the get to do's. That's basically the, just to show you that it actually does things correctly, um, this method right here. So, yeah, all, all of the standard methods are now being kind of um, annotated automatically and, and collected. Um, and find all is basically a part of the to do repository. So, I think the library for that one is the Spring Data Library. So there are individual libraries for collecting all those metrics. And in the end, it goes down to, to the database level. So the same thing we're able to see if you look at the traces for, for the post traces. So the one with the 15 spans is, I think, the delete call. So yeah, it goes into the remove to do. Then it goes delete by ID and so on. And then you can also s always see the breakdown of those things um, as, they, um, as they appear. All right, um, so this is all the things that you can do with this so-called auto-instrumentation. Um, it will, as I said, it will query a set of default pre-selected methods, so like the, the REST endpoints and the typical uh, like spring, spring data methods that the, the CRUD repository will, will bring up. So the problem, of course, now is what if you have some own methods that you want to instrument yourself as well. So basically saying, OK, um, let's do it like this. I have, I have this add to do, and I'm just going to say string some useless method. And so I'm just going to basically Grade this one out and say, I'm going to copy that over here. And this one will, in the end, do my repository call. So um, this doesn't, I need to return something. All right. So this one, by default, will not get annotated in, in this environment. So I can now I can rebuild it and say, maybe um, do the, the compile the, the, the back end again. And on the other side, I'm going to stop my environment here. So um, if I go in there now and say, okay, I'm going, I need to rebuild my um, so, um, and I built this container with the name Otel. Oh, this is an echo, this is not what we want. Um, 
yeah, I think I try to shortcut it before and put them all into files because I was just rebuilding that all the time. Um, and now if we do, I think I need to be careful. I have many different Docker Compose files here. So this one is actually using the hotel one. That should be all right. Um, so I'm going to say Docker Compose up. All right. Um, so this should be back up again now. So if I refresh my website, um, you can now see there's nothing being monitored yet. Well, there's one call. I think this is some kind of an, an error call. Um, yeah, this is, um, it just picks up one qu kind of database query, but there is no application traffic yet. So I can do this again here now and say ABC, CDE, whatsoever. And then I, I refresh here. So I now have these calls again. Um, let's say find traces. And if I go in there now and say, okay, did I, it was the post call that I actually instrumented, then again, I don't see it. Um, so basically, it goes from add to do directly to this to do repository safe. So basically, the method I, I added is not getting picked up by that standard um, instrumentation. So for that, we basically have to uh, go a level deeper and say, um, yeah, I'm now adding this dependency of the um, so-called IO of telemetry instrumentation. So I basically, that gives me access to that API, and now I can basically implement things on, on code level. So I have this method here now, and now what I can annotate is say, with span, that will define or declare this method as a, sp as, as a span in my overall trace. And um, I could also say, okay, I don't want, I, don't want, I do not only want this method to be included, but I also want to collect some individual metrics that should be, that should be shown up right later on in my, in my dashboard. So there's the span attribute, um, which will then later on say, okay, this is the, 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 um, the attribute I want to have. So we could, of course, play some things here and say, if to do equals whatever, um, slow, then we say thread sleep for a minute, and we surround that with a try and catch block. Um, we could also say to do done. <laughs> um, if to do equals fail, then we say system exit zero um, to create some error scenario um, and to see, let's see how all that behaves. So I'm going to stop this one again now. And um, I, I need to rebuild, of course. And now I'm going to rebuild the um, agent. So I'm just going to call this now OSDK, um, or maybe O instrument, whatever. <laughs> um, and and build it. I just need to be careful that I don't get confused here and I don't confuse you much. So I, we don't do any changes on the front end side, so we just did this. And um, now I'm going to go into my um, Docker Compose file, um, not the Docker file, the Docker Compose, and say, okay, now please use that latest build of the back end, which is oinst. And yeah, start it again. So I'm just going to make sure all the containers are being removed. Uh, 
All right, so this should be back. And I'm going to go into the UI again. So there's nothing there yet. Um, let's add a few things. Um, so this one and one test. And now go back here. And if the dem demo gods are all with me, no, they're not with me, it seems, because I think we have lost it. Um, <laughs> uh, let me just think for a second. No, it's not putting this up. Let me just have a look. Um, this looks all correct. Let me just see the we this component also has a, a local endpoint, so so this one got added, and so it runs, but it doesn't collect at the moment. So they're all in there. This is great, but why are I not seeing them here in the? Yeah, for some reason, um, it's not picking it up right now. I don't, and I only have 20 minutes left. I don't want to debug that. But I, I have a, I have a compose file because I did it this morning. So I have a compose file which pulls a container that is actually Im implemented correctly. Um, and just to make sure, I show it to you once. I'm doing this same error over and over again. Okay. Um, now go back to my application, please. So I now refresh this. So this should be all empty again. Okay. And let's see if we are. <laughs> so this is starting to get annoying. So I, maybe I haven't. Rem I should remove so all, all these components and then start it once again. Let me just. Okay, this is the problem. Um, I am using the wrong file here. So yeah, jumping too much around between the things. I'm just going to rebuild it once more um, before I give up. I have, it, I have it on screenshots, but I really wanted to show this live. Just one more check here. It's, it's in the application. This is OK. It's in here. This is instrumented. OK. I actually don't need to do this, so I'm going to build. 
yeah, I see the problem now. I used the wrong Docker file. So that's why I did not get instrumented. Yeah, sorry for all that mess that I have here. Um, so this, sh do we actually see this? Yeah, the open telemetry agent is now there. Um, okay. Um, Just check real quick. Too many containers, you probably know this. Okay, this one has just been built now. And you're looking on your watch. <laughs> no. Um, Yeah, if it doesn't work on this run, uh, I'm not going to continue here. This is good to have this lab session, right? if this, uh, or deep dive. That you probably know this is what, how, how it normally goes. Um, all right. Now, please, 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 double please. Um, if I refresh that, they're all gone. And yeah, we have things in here. So I'll find the traces. Um, for this post one. Yeah, we see it now. So between the add to do and the to do repository save, we see now this some useless method which has been, which we have annotated before. Um, and if we kind of expand that um, and look into it, we can also basically see what is the name of the to do that we basically put in there. So also, if I go in there now and basically type slow, then you can see it takes a bit until it basically popped in. And now if we do that again um, and say, OK, what, what else did we have? Find traces. So we see one that took significantly longer just now, over a second, because that's the second that I added. And if I go in there now, I can see this is this some useless method which took the major part of my time. Um, and compared to all the other things, it, it's significantly longer. So this is basically where I would have to dig deeper. I can also try and be experimental and say I'm going to add the fail one, but this is probably going to, I'm not sure if this is going to go well. So obviously something crashes. The back end is now gone. And um, if I look it up in, in here, I should probably now see, okay, here's one with an error. Um, looking in there. So... Um, yeah, this post call creates the error and then it backs out. Funny wise, um, let me just look at the code. The, the save part, you can see that here. This has still been executed successfully. As we can see, so the to-do actually has been added. But after that, the crash occurred and that's why we see that error here. All right, so I think um, with this, I would probably want to bring this to an end um, for today. Uh, we have about 50 minutes left, so I want to leave some time for questions. But I think, uh, yeah, you have now seen um, how things work on, 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 on this deep kind of level. So same, uh, that what we've seen in Java will go for, for other languages as well. If you want to instrument using such an SDK, you need to know the language well, you need to know what to monitor. Um, but only then and only then you will get the, the depth of those metrics. All right, so let's jump in here again. So you see that? Okay. So, yeah, this is just a screenshot of, of, of what is getting going to be, to be added. Um, this is basically the width span and the span attribute that we have just seen um, and how they basically pop up later on in, in Jaeger. All right, so, yeah, you have seen... Uh, quite a, a bit of tools um, from us now. If you still can't get enough, the landscape offers a lot more to you. Um, one thing that I might want to point out real quick at this point um, is a thing my, my colleagues have built. It's called openapm.io. And this basically... Um, is a list of all the various toolings that you would potentially find in that space. So, um, and it, it, it allows you to say, um, um, I want to add them to the, to the top right here. And so, so 
nothing has been selected. I try to select something. Um, let's maybe go here. Here we go. <laughs> okay, we ha okay, we have something here now. And then you can basically say, okay, um, what can be imported into this tool? So this one can basically uh, use something, collecting something from FluentD. Where can it connect to? To Loki, for example. Um, and Loki, in turn, can export something to Grafana. So this is like a compatibility matrix of all the, all the tools out there um, that you can use to basically see which components are working with which others. Um, and it builds some very nice graphics in there. So, and that's basically it. So uh, we've come to the deepest point of, um, of observability. I mean, the next thing would potentially then be write an own library for your application if this is not enough, what you, what you currently get. As, as you have seen, this one goes down to method and variable level, so you can do root cause analysis and figure out where your problems are. But in turn, you pay the price that you basically have to go into the application and, and change your code manually. And of course, the agents are specific to programming languages and frameworks. So if there is a programming language or framework that you use that doesn't provide an agent for it, then there's basically not much you can do about it except write the agent by yourself. Um, this is, of course, different than if you go back to service meshes and API things, um, because then they don't really care what is inside of your container. And, um, and, and uh, you can certainly use it for everything here. All right, so um, we're not going to say this one is better or this one is worse. I mean, our idea here is basically to show you a bit of a category of things, uh, what, what, what is currently out there, what would you be able to use, and also get an idea of, of what the overhead uh, is that you have to, to take with it. And yeah, uh, recommendation is certainly with all the tools here that we've shown are absolutely free. Try them out, play with them, and, and they all will potentially help you on the decision um, which, is, which is the part that you wanna uh, that you wanna use most, or that you're mostly interested in? Right. Yeah, I so I wanted to interject one more time. It? I wanted to interject oh, please, before please, we please, do please. that. Get off my platform. Just okay. kidding. Okay. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Basically, like in general, the like three of the main pillars of observability. Basically, we have we looked at a bunch of stuff with like metrics. We looked at a bunch of stuff with tracing. There is also logging stuff, which we didn't really go into here. I mean, there, by default, you could do like cube cuddle logs and get stuff for the containers that you currently have up and running. Um, you could use kubelet logs if you have access to the uh, control plane uh, VMs or whatever you're running that. But like, say if your containers go away, then the logs, you can't really go and be like, I want to get those logs for this thing that was running earlier. So you need things for log aggregation. Like we clicked on stuff that was like, there was like FluentD, FluentBit, et cetera. Um, so it's, I think, maybe two years old now if you are bored enough to hear me for 11 more minutes. Um, at, not now, but if you go to um, cube.academy, uh, why is and Zs? Uh, if you go look for instructors and then look up me, there is this course that I was part of. Um, if you go to observability, um, I it's like, a, it says it's 11 minutes, so I trust it. Um, basically, it's like high level that goes into some of the other things with like using uh, Elasticsearch, Kibana, FluentD, FluentBit, and talking a little bit more about like metrics and just like also some of the high level stuff with uh, tracing and so like tracing, logging, and metrics and kind of going over that a little bit more since we didn't go into all the things there. But yeah, it's just a free thing on Cube Academy if you want to look into that as well. So, all right. And now I'm going to get off my platform. You can stay there. I mean, first of all, we're going to probably say thanks for listening and hanging out for us for three hours. Um, it was uh, a lot of fun from our side. I hope we were able to, to uh, show you some kind of new ideas and, and aspects of all that. And um, yeah, we still have 10 minutes for questions. If you want to see some of the components again or have some specific things that we can certainly look into. Um, if not... You, we give you back 10 minutes of your time. But either way, thanks for listening in the first place. And please, again, please rate. That would be super awesome. And if you have any feedback, that'd be great, too, so that we can get better they, at things. They wanted to clap, and now you're interrupting Oh, I'm them. so sorry. <laughs> All right, I'm going to leave now. Bye. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot.
Ja. Okay, so uh, I just try to, to rephrase. Um, well, next to the open telemetry, we showed that, that there's other options to query the metrics, from, especially from a Java landscape like with JMX you mentioned and, and others, and, and what is the best? I mean, this is something we can probably not answer. Uh, what is the best? I mean, the, the best is always the, the best one for a certain given a situation. I mean, this is partially one of the reasons why we, we do this talk. To, to show the various options and maybe give a bit of pros and cons for the individual solutions. Um, with, I mean, and it also depends, of course, are you running, how are you running your Java applications? Is that in a, in a Kubernetes environment? Um, or is it still, is it like a standalone on, on some servers uh, where you would potentially have, have, have different options? I mean, um, the things we've shown here are the things that you probably know best. So um, I, I'm definitely a big fan of, of open telemetry, also to see how it's basically growing, how the agents are evolving. So that's probably a thing I would bet on that is going to be around uh, for quite a while, especially as, the, as the, the, the vendors join in. There are probably more exotic solutions um, which don't have that much, uh, that big community that can potentially do a bit more here and there. But, but on the long run, you never know how safe you're going to be and if they're going to be still continued and, 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 and being used uh, once you adopt them uh, further and put them into production or so on. So I know this is probably not the answer you would want to have, but this is only as far as I can go here. I mean, this is a big problem. I mean, uh, and it's not only in, of course, in Java. This is more like in, in the area of Kubernetes and the CNCF in general. I mean, that's the, we, of course, make a lot of fun when we show that kind of landscape and we make fun about it. But we also see this is the problem our, our clients are having. I mean, I'm, I'm working as a, as, a, as a consultant and I implement these solutions for my clients and a, they have the same problem. They say, well, there is so much. Um, what, what should we eventually choose? And um, the, the only thing I can say is, well, I have some sort of experience with some of them. Um, a, a good thing would certainly be to evaluate and, and try out a few and, and also list what, what are your are your requirements on that? Is it, is it one application that you monitor or is it like a whole landscape or how big is your company? Do you want to all integrate it into one dashboard or do you want it only a, a specific drill down into one? This would all affect the decision in the end what, what, what you want to pick. And yeah, as I said, the, we haven't found a solution yet to make this not grow any bigger. It, it, it is continuously growing. That's also why I pointed out open telemetry is actually a a good thing in my opinion in there because it kind of um, like makes the, the selection smaller uh, to, to say okay this is like now a new, sta new standard for the collection side of the metrics which will certainly help if you monitor a, a broad range of, of applications and will put it together. But yeah this is I don't have anything to add. I mean, if somebody else has a certain uh, opinion on, or answer on that, feel free to, to say. But um, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't found a better solution yet. Anything? Yeah, this is the updated CNCF landscape. So it has a little bit more maybe than our screenshot. But as you can see, there's a lot, and it just keeps getting bigger. There's so many different things and all sorts of different categories to like go through. And some of it's just like, it helps a little bit for some of it because if you look, you can kind of see that uh, in certain ones there are things that have at least like graduated or like certain levels that maybe are things that you could first start looking at instead and just kind of seeing what uh, maybe what others have used or playing around with things. I know you can't obviously go through all of this. I don't think there's enough time in a day. <laughs> yeah, and even with three hours, we hit the limit. So <laughs> they don't have any longer sessions than that. And I'm actually happy that... We got a bit of break now. <laughs> All right. Anything else? And oh, that's one, one very on the top. Yeah. 
Come, come, come closer to us, please. <laughs> SFTP library mm -hmm. and uh, it takes time to execute the code and you want to get the details for instance if it's a matter of um, having time spent on establishing the SSH connection or for instance uh, the time of the actual upload of the file or something like this so is this possible to inject let's say the mm, retrieval of the metrics into the third party libraries we use? W w so, I'm not sure if I understand it correctly. So, do you want to um, take the metrics that you collect and uh, ask if you can insert, insert it in something like the tools we've shown, like Prometheus or, or, or telemetry? Uh, I have an application. Yeah. I'm using the um, third-party library that is executing the FT SFTP file upload. The, well, uh, what, what is being uploaded? Just like the collection of uh, the yeah, metrics? I, I'm uploading a file. Okay. I want to learn what time does it take for that library first to establish the SSH channel to do the transmission, and then how much time does the actual upload of the file takes? Okay. Um, and is this execution being done within the application? Like, is that part of a, of a, the yeah, Java stack? It, yeah, but it's just like in uh, my application, it's just one line send the file. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm providing the, uh, the file, the, the source file that is being uploaded. And underneath the hood, uh, actually, it's Apache, the virtual file system. Uh, it's establishing the, uh, the channel, and then it's uploading the file, and it takes long. Okay. And I want to learn what is actually taking so much time to execute. Is it actually the, the setup of the connection, or the upload, or? Well, this is kind of ha hard to answer. I mean, I would say two ways, maybe. I mean, o on one hand, you can, of course, network uh, monitor on the network level and basically see when the connection is open, when it is closed, and, and get all the metrics from, from that transaction. O or if this is being executed out of a programming language, as we've just saw, you can also use tracing and put an endpoint before and after that, and then you at least get the, uh, get the time span of how long this takes. It will not give you, however, the details why the network connection might be slow or why the upload takes so long. This is, these are pure network metrics, and this can depend on many things, like how far is the other peer away, how good is your, your, your connectivity, what is the bandwidth, and so on. Okay, but uh, as we saw, the, mm, in, I don't remember, not the telemetry, but the, the thing that came after, like this. Is it possible like, to, to somehow inject, because we added uh, annotation for the method to actually with span and... Uh, we got the details. Is, yeah. it, is it possible somehow to say, OK, I want to span for this method at everything that is executed below? Well, it depends on if everything is act that's executed below is also in that programming language. You can, of course, add further spans to further methods. Okay, but if, if it leaves the application, then it's going to be tricky because then you would have to write, I like, have an agent for the other component which is invokes. But you could still correlate it like that with the transaction headers. I mean, this is, this is certainly possible. But it, it very much goes into a manual instrumentation then. I mean, I don't see an, like an out-of-the-box solution to, to what you're asking for. Okay. But I would have to look into it closer. But it's just like from what I'm hearing right now. The, ma the main thing which is interesting is that we added the width span annotation and to the method, and we got some additional details. What yeah. I'm interested in if there is such way that I'm saying, OK, with span to the method, which executes another method, yeah. it automatically gets details of the sub-methods that are called. Oh, so you're basically asking for an annotation in a say, with span and e recursively every method underneath. Um, it is technically possible, but you need to um, you need to go fur further go into the direction of what does the SDK for Java offer and potentially extend it for your own purposes. I don't, I'd, I'm not aware of um, a method out of the box that does that. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, it says zero minutes. So if you have any more questions, we pr pr probably like leave the stage at least, and you can also certainly find us outside. Um, but just like to give room for the, for the next presenters, um, shut it down here. All right, so thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.